Our story opens today at the Slick Observatory, where an international group of scientists, eggheads and double domes, were meeting to dedicate the new giant 1,000-inch telescope. The chairman, Sir Newton Fugg, was presiding. Today we will prove once and for all that there can be no life on the moon. Dr. Milton Nudnik, egghead of the year, was given the honor of the first peak. What do you see? I see two moon creatures. Impossible! The scientists rushed to the eyepiece, and incredibly, Nudnik was right. Why? It's a moon moose! And he's signaling us! What does he say? He says... Here we come, ready or not. Sure enough, a strange rocket ship had left the moon and was heading straight for the Earth. The word spread in a flash. Extra, extra, moon men to invade Earth. President declares emergency. Now hear this. This is Dorson Bell speaking. The moon rocket ship is nearing the Earth. This invasion is not a play, I repeat. Not a play. Please feel free to panic. And some people did panic. Stores closed, houses were shut up tight. Everywhere, panic reigned. What's the headlines, George? Invasion from moon. Hmm. So what else is new? Meanwhile, at Washington Airport, the newly appointed ambassador to the moon, Krevney Blatt, and other dignitaries and diplomats were waiting for the strange craft to land. Here it comes! The rocket ship had made a perfect one-point landing, and while all eyes watched expectantly, the hatch opened. Welcome, moon people. You dig them, Earth talk? Bullwinkle, they think we're moon people. They do? Then take me to your president. No, no, no. We got to tell him the truth. Gentlemen, I'm Rocky the Flying Squirrel. And I'm Bullwinkle the Moose. And we're both from Frostbite Falls, Minnesota. Minnesota? You mean you've been to the moon and back? Why, they've discovered a great new rocket fuel. And so do a hero's acclaim, our adventurers told their strange and incredible story. It seemed that just days before, in their little house in Frostbite Falls, Bullwinkle had been baking a quick-rising cake, according to his grandmother's old recipe. But the first layer... Had risen a little faster than they'd expected. And the next thing they knew, the stove had been blown clear to the moon. Well, they had to get it back. Sure, we still owe two payments on it. And so the boys put together their version of a spaceship and used the second layer of that extraordinary cake to propel them to the moon. And the third layer blasted us back. That cake better must be a revolutionary rocket fuel. My boy, you must make more of that cake for your government. Bullwinkle, you're going to be a famous scientist. Well, after all, I am a graduate of MIT. The Moose Institute of Toe Dancing. Unfortunately, our boys wouldn't have been so happy had they overheard two notorious spies. You hear, Natasha? First get the formula and then kill the moose or vice versa. And so a short while later, the new director of guided moosles was interrupted by... Hello, you great, big, wonderful moose. Boy, that's right neighborly of you. You will give me grandmama's recipe? What for? Well, I hope to be a grandmama myself someday. I'd love to, but in the explosion, I only saved half my recipe. I know how much, but not what of. Natasha's friend then did a very unneighborly thing. <coughs> Darling, will you please hold this package for me? Well, I'd plan to leave in a couple of minutes. Don't worry, you will. Sounds like a clock. Bullwinkle's steel trap mind had done it again. It was a clock, only attached to 14 sticks of dynamite, and it was wired to go off in 30 seconds. Don't miss tomorrow's exciting episode, Bullwinkle's Ride, or Goodbye, Darling. You remember how surprised the world scientists were when they looked through their thousand-inch telescope and saw Rocky and Bullwinkle flying back from the moon. But when the boys made their one-point landing, the explanation was ridiculously simple. Bullwinkle had tried to bake a quick rising cake from his grandmother's recipe. The result, naturally, was the world's most powerful rocket fuel. Bullwinkle was immediately ordered to go to work for the government to duplicate the recipe, which, unfortunately, had been torn in half in the explosion. Yeah, I know how much, but not what of. Everybody was interested in the result, including two notorious spies, Boris Badenov and Natasha Fatal. Failing in their attempt to get the formula, they decided to do away with the moose. So Natasha handed him a ticking package containing 14 sticks of dynamite, wired to go off in 30 seconds. I'd plan to leave in a couple of minutes. Don't worry, darling. You will. But as Natasha tried to open the door, she found it had been locked behind her. The key. Where's the cotton-picking key? Oh, the key. Well, uh, I got it here somewhere. 18 seconds. 17. 16. But see, here's the key to my locker at PS84. Hurry up, please. Key to my hope chest. It's little, because I'm kind of hopeless. I must go quickly. I'm doing my level best. 12, 11, 10. Three trunk keys, in case I ever grow a trunk. Time is running out. Eight, seven, six. Hey, that one belongs to the Frostbite Falls Volunteer Fire Department. 
Yeah, wonder how they're starting the engine these days. Give me my package, you fool! Three, two, one. That's what I like. Precision timing. A few minutes later, Bullwinkle found the right key, and the furious Natasha left to meet her partner in crime. Boris promised to meet me here. Where is he? Oh, there you are, darling. What do we do next? We do what any intelligent, self-sufficient spy with real initiative would do. We wait for instructions. Meanwhile, the fact that Bullwinkle's rocket fuel was made from his grandmother's fudge cake recipe was having a great effect on the whole country. Top scientists discarded their most complex apparatus. Erwin, go get me an eight-inch cake tin and a set of cookie cutters. Colleges changed their course of study. This year, gentlemen, we will study atomic structure, nuclear physics, and fudge making. The effect spread to other countries. But you are top nuclear physicist. How come you are sent to Siberia? My biscuits were too heavy. In the USA, grandmothers rose to national prominence. As advisors to the president... It's raining. You'd better put on your rubbers. As scientists... I'd like you to meet our new head of research and development. Hello, boys. Even bathing beauty contests took on a new look. Grandmothers reigned supreme. In their own laboratory, Rocky and Bullwinkle were still hard at work. Here's the latest one, Rocky. Will it make a good rocket fuel, Bullwinkle? Well, I don't know, but it'll sure make a dandy lunch. <laughs> the boys wouldn't have been so happy if they had chance to look behind them, for at that moment, a scaly green hand was raising a strange weapon and pointing it right at their heads. Don't miss the next exciting episode, Bullseye Bullwinkle or Destination Moose. Well... Rocky and Bullwinkle really started something just by trying to bake a cake. For instead of dessert, they wound up with an explosive <laughs> that blew their stove clean to the moon. The nation was astounded. That cake batter must be a revolutionary rocket fuel. Grandma called it fudge cake. Bullwinkle was immediately made director of guided moussels, and he and Rocky set out to duplicate the recipe, which unfortunately had been torn in half by the explosion. But apparently not everybody wanted them to succeed. For when we left them last time, a scaly green hand was raising a sinister weapon and pointing it right at their heads. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle! Look there! Mm. Now, Kidney? Not now, Clyde. Why not? I haven't scrooched anybody since we've been here. What are they, Rocky? I don't know. I've never seen anything like them. Maybe they're congressmen. Who? Who are you? Put your hands over your head, please, and no sudden moves. Cloyd here is very nervous. Yes, especially in this finger. Yeah, that's the worst one, too. What do you fellas want, anyway? Yeah, and how come the funny suits? Funny suits? They're out of this world. You're so right. I am? Yes. We're from the moon. The, the moon? moon? Yes, and if there's one thing we don't want, it's an invasion from Earth. Especially an invasion of tourists. We lead such a quiet life on the moon. Take a look at what we had to go through just to prepare for a visit here. Yeah, we had to practice dodging traffic. And listening to jukeboxes. And filling out forms. And breathing smog. And riding on subways. And regular bathing. Oh, it was awful. Seven of us were chosen. Only two made it. So you see, we must stop you from using that formula. One way or another. Well, I don't mind that one way. It's the another that bothers me. But we don't even have the formula yet. Do I scrooge them now, Kidney? Well, not if they don't have the formula. Oh, moon rats. But we'll come back. And as soon as they get the rocket fuel... Zap! Yes, zap. Bye now. And the two green men slipped out through the ventilator shaft. Hours later, as they made their way home... Moon man, boy, were you scared, Bullwinkle? Of course not. Uh, you suppose I can take my hands down now? But our boys still weren't out of danger, for in his hotel room 12 stories up, Boris was readying another fiendish plan.
You have the orders in code, Natasha? Yes. So translate. Let me see. These two words say, kill moose. I knew it. And look, the squirrel is with him. He's going to be a double feature. And the heavy safe hurtles straight down toward the unsuspecting pair. Be sure to see our next episode, Squeeze Play, or Invitation to the Trance. In trying to rediscover their secret rocket fuel, Rocky and Bullwinkle have been threatened by two moon men who will go to any lengths to keep Earth tourists from cluttering up the surface of the moon, even to scrooching our heroes if need be. And if that weren't bad enough, when the boys were on their way home, the two spies, Boris and Natasha, received their latest instructions. Don't tell me, let me guess. I'll bet it says, kill moose, right? Right. Okay. But in front are two more words, do not. Do not kill moose. Oh, Boris, you impetuous boy, what have you done? Better yet, what will you do? Save him! I've got to save him! Boris raced to beat the heavy safe to the ground, and he won. Almost. The heavy safe drove him into the ground like a tent stake. Bullwinkle's keen mind knew instantly what had happened. Hey, up there! You dropped your safe. Boris! Boris, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Boris, darling, you're alive. This is living. In the next few days, the boys worked like demons, measuring, sifting, rolling, baking. And the results were tremendous. Seven layer cheesecakes, hot fudge strudel, an acre of cinnamon pizzas, and 200 pounds of peanut brittle. Unfortunately, none of it would explode. Golly, Bullwinkle, people are depending on us. The world's waiting for our discovery. That recipe is locked in your brain somewhere. It is? Yep. All we gotta do is figure out how to get it out. Hey, I got it. Hypnosis. Hypnosis? You'll be hypnotized, and while you're asleep, you'll tell us the recipe. I'm gonna talk in my sleep? Yeah. Swell. Usually I just snore. We'll get the world's greatest hypnotist to come here and... Who is it? It is I, Swami Ben Boris, world's greatest hypnotist. This is my assistant. Haven't we met before? Were you ever in Cairo? No. Well, that's it then. Neither was I. Now let's get to work. Shucks, you can't hypnotize me. I got too much brain power. I'm just a... <laughs> yes, master. All right. What is in the recipe? Wait a minute. You'll have to leave now. This is top secret stuff. Oh, don't worry, I won't listen. On my honor as a genuine swami. What about the lady? She doesn't speak English, do you, dear? Of course not. Well, maybe she better put her fingers in her ears anyway. Okay. At least the formula will be mine. Now, Mr. Moose, tell me everything you know. So Bullwinkle told them everything he knew, all about his early days in the Minnesota woods, his days at the Philpott School for Exceptional Children, and he was exceptional, being the only student with antlers. His experiences in the Army, where he served three years as a hat rack in the officers' club. On and on he went without stopping for 12 hours. But true to their promise, Boris and Natasha didn't hear a word. The steady drone had long since sent them to dreamland. Unfortunately, it had done the same thing to Rocky. And so when Bullwinkle finally got to Grandma's recipe, the only people who heard it weren't people at all, but the two moon men. Did you hear that, Gidney? Yes, Cloyd. It's exactly the formula we use. Oh, boy! Can I scrooge him now? Yes, Cloyd. You can scrooge him now. Don't fail to see our next episode, The Scrooged Moose. Well, Rocky and Bullwinkle's attempts to find a rocket fuel to take them to the moon has certainly raised a fuss, especially on the moon itself. We moved to the dark side just to get away from those peeping toms in their telescopes. Now they're going to come right on up. We must stop them! So the moon men selected two of their hardiest adventurers and sent them down to Earth with only one mission, to stop our heroes from finding the formula. And so when a hypnotized Bullwinkle recited his recipe for Grandma Moose's fudge cake, even to a sleeping audience... Can I scrooge him now, Gidney? Yes, Clyde. Scrooge him now. As the mysterious ray struck Bullwinkle, he was instantly frozen solid, stiff as a board. So that's what it was like to be scrooged. Where do we put it? Let's take it home in our flying saucer. The moon men had scarcely left the room when Boris woke up. Go on, go on. I didn't miss a word. Where did he go? Oh, there he went. 
Hey, you! Come back with my moose! But he knows the formula. We, we gotta take him along. Don't be foolish. You miss the brains of the outfit. The brains? Who's that? The squirrel. He knows the formula, too. He does? Do I look like a liar? Don't answer. You go get him. I'll mind your moose for you. The moon men dash back to where Rocky and Natasha were still dozing. All right, everybody up. Ooh, it's all right, lady. They're just plain ordinary moon men. Which one of you is the brains? I, I am. am. Because if you are, we're going to scrooch you. He she is. is. Which one is the squirrel? That's me. Where's Bullwinkle? We're taking him with us. You too. Come on. Bye-bye, darling. Have a nice trip. It looked bad, but Rocky's number wits were hard at work. Okay, we'll go, but it does seem a shame to miss the party. Uh, party? Sure. The government always throws a big party for visiting spacemen. With... with paper hats? And noisemakers? Yeah. Well, maybe we could wait a little while. Of course we need our entertainment, Chairman. Who's he? My pal, Bullwinkle. Oh, that's easy. We left him right... He's gone. Sure enough, the wily Boris had stolen Bullwinkle and was at that moment heading for a lonely house high on a hill. He can't go far. That moose was scrooched. Scrooched? How long did you scrooch him for, Cloyd? The dial said eight. Eight what? I don't know. It's either eight hours or eight years. Well, Bullwinkle was still frozen solid and Boris couldn't loosen him up. Then exactly eight hours later... Your conscience. Uh, no, I'm Bullwinkle. Where am I? This is your new laboratory. I am your new assistant. Shall we get to work? Well, uh, let's see. I guess so. Uh, two cups of flour, one teaspoon salt. Are you taking all this down? Yes, yes. Uh, could you speak a little louder? I'm rather hard of hearing. Oh, certainly. A testing, one, two, three. Little did Bullwinkle know that Boris's hearing aid was in reality a powerful shortwave transmitter and that every word he uttered was instantly heard in another country far away by a band of sinister spies. Don't fail to see our next episode, Monitored Moose or the Carbon Copycats. You remember that while Bullwinkle was hypnotized, he named all of the ingredients of a secret rocket fuel. He had already bored Rocky and the two spies into a sound slumber, but there were still two witnesses to hear him, the moon men. Their reaction was quick and to the point. They scrooched Bullwinkle and started off to the moon with him. When Boris saw what was happening, he managed to turn their attention to Rocky while he made off with the moose. When Bullwinkle recovered, he was in a new laboratory with a new assistant who looked remarkably like Boris Badenov and who wore a hearing aid that broadcast directly to a nest of spies in a foreign country. Not only that, but the spies had a laboratory set up to duplicate Bullwinkle's every move. You're receiving, Hockey? Hockey. Turn on speaker. Let's see now. Two cups of flour? Got that? Got it. A pound of kumquats? Got it. Right, Chief. Shh. Listen. And now, a hat full of vanilla to give it character. You sure this is chemical experiment? Oh, sure, why? Sounds more like girl's cooking class. Uh-oh, he's a smart one. Well, Bullwinkle, what do you do now? Bullwinkle was a mite embarrassed by not knowing the scientific names of anything until he spotted a chemistry dictionary on a shelf. Quickly, he opened it. Well, uh, how's this now? Three ounces of uh, methylene bromide and a cube of uh, diphenophosphate. That's better. You getting all this? And now a dozen uh, benzochlorines. Benzochlorines? But... Quiet. Do as he says. Now we'll just pop it into a hot oven for about an hour. Pop it into... No, not that. We must follow his directions exactly. Pop it in. So obeying Bullwinkle's instructions, the spies put their mixture into the oven. As a result, their laboratory instantly disappeared. While the only result in Bullwinkle's lab was... Oh, darn. Just another mess of chocolate pan dowdy. Hello, you receiving me? Hello, fearless leader. Funny they don't answer. But while Bullwinkle didn't think much of his latest effort, it was doing him a lot of good, for its fragrant aroma drifted out of the window and down the hill and eventually reached the sensitive nose of his best friend. Hey, smell that? 
Smell what? That delicious aroma. I don't smell anything. Cloyd, we don't have noses. Oh, I forgot for a minute. But I do, and I'm going to follow it right to Bullwinkle. And so over every obstacle, Rocky followed the smell of Bullwinkle's chocolate pan dowdy. It took him right to the house on the hill, but he didn't approach unobserved. Curses, is that nosy squirrel. I must work fast. And Boris did work fast, for when Rocky reached the house... Gee whiz, looks like I was expected. Do not turn back. Go on instead. Your friend the moose is just ahead. Boris shave. Ten feet to moose. Too far. Go back five feet. Mm, stand here. Pull rope. But when Rocky pulled the rope, a trap door opened under him and the plucky squirrel dropped from sight. See? It pays to advertise. Don't miss our next episode, Rocky's Dilemma, or a squirrel in a stew. Well, it looks as if that crafty spy, Boris Badenov, is one up on our heroes, for he has managed to steal Bullwinkle from the Moon Men and has taken him to his lonely house on the hill, where the moose is putting his massive intellect to work on rediscovering his secret rocket fuel. All he's been able to make so far is a batch of chocolate pandari, but its aroma caught the attention of his pal, Rocky. Rocky set out to find Bullwinkle, and for a while it seemed that Boris was actually helping him. But at the last minute, Rocky found that the signs had led him straight into a trap. For a while, Rocky was certainly going downhill fast, but a few seconds later, he was really going up in the world. Farewell, you miserable rodent. Happy landings, right in middle of ocean. <laughs> And while the balloon took Rocky far out over the ocean, the unsuspecting Bullwinkle was still experimenting, only this time with real chemicals. And as Boris approached the lab... You know, I think I had it for a second there. Splendid. Now, would you mind getting off my neck and back to work? I must be working him too hard. He looks pooped. But two famous scientists like Rocky and Bullwinkle couldn't disappear without somebody wondering what had happened, and it soon appeared that everybody did. Read all about it! Bullwinkle disappears! All police stations were notified. This scientist has the following distinguishing marks. A small mole on his left shoulder blade. Also a six-foot pair of antlers. The hunt for the missing moose went on in every state in the Union except one. When asked why, the governor replied, Of course, it ain't moose hunting season yet. But in most places, the search went on doggedly, and probably the most eager searchers were the two moon men. Gidney and Cloyd wanted Bullwinkle as entertainment chairman of a party in their honor. Their methods were very simple. They just went from door to door where their appearance met with varying results. I don't want any magazines, but I'd sure like to know what college you're working your way through. Good heavens, is it trick-or-treat night already? No brushes today, thanks. It's not a brush, it's a mustache. Hey, Mabel, looks like some more of your relatives again. This isn't getting us anywhere, Gidney. Just one more house, Cloyd. And Gidney's diligence was rewarded. That one more house belonged to Boris Badenov. Zounds, it's those lunar loonies. They mustn't see me. This is the last one, Gidney. My pods are killing me. Down here, they call them feet. Do you think we'll ever get to go to our party? Oh, sure, I'll bet that Bullwinkle chap is getting things ready right now. Party, eh? Natasha, come here quickly. And a few moments later, Boris flung his door wide open. Surprise, surprise, come in, come in. We thought you'd never get here. Welcome to Earth, darlings, and many happy returns. Cloyd, it's a surprise party. Surprise me, all right. Here are the paper hats. And the noisemakers. Delightful. Nothing like noisemakers to pep up a party. But those noisemakers were more deadly than delightful, for Bullwinkle's lab was in the room just overhead. Must be fixed in the street. Don't go on. Don't make test tubes like they used to. Now you just make yourselves at home while I make the punch. Is my own recipe. Is it good? Good. He's <laughs> knockout. And while Boris prepared a lethal potion for the moon men, the balloon carrying Rocky was in a terrible storm out over the Atlantic. Suddenly there was a searing bolt of lightning, an explosion, and the shattered balloon basket plummeted toward the angry ocean 10,000 feet below. Don't miss our next exciting episode, The Submarine Squirrel or 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea. Last time you remember, Boris Badenov had captured Rocky and set him adrift in a balloon. The balloon was struck by lightning and plummeted down toward the ocean thousands of feet below. As the balloon fell, the plucky squirrel managed to work his way out of the basket and spreading his arms and legs began to glide toward the distant shore miles away. Boy! 
Joey, I hope I can stretch my glide that far. Unfortunately, at that moment, Rocky was being picked up by the radar antennas of the Air Defense Headquarters. General Broadbeam, sir, we've spotted the flying objects headed straight for us. What kind of object? Well, sir, it appears to be a squirrel. A what? Yes, sir. Hmm. Probably a secret missile we don't know about. Well, we can't take chances. Shoot it down. And within seconds, huge batteries of weapons were leveled at Rocky and commenced fire. Loki smoke! They think I'm an enemy! Hey! Cut it out! I'm friendly! Look! I'm smiling! Oh, if there were just some way I could tell them who I am! Then the brainy squirrel got an idea and began to fly in a special pattern. Look, General, the object is spelling something out. Sure enough, the wily Rocky was using the smoke from the ak ak burst to spell out letters, a kind of polka dot skywriting. What's it say, General? U S. Cease firing! Don't harm a hair of his head! That is a U.S. taxpayer! We need every one of them we can get! So Rocky continued gliding toward the shore, this time with an honor escort of jet planes. Meanwhile, at Boris's house, the spy was pretending to throw a party in honor of the Moon Men, complete with paper hats and noisemakers, while Bullwinkle worked in the room above. Uh, mind if I join you? In a corner of the room, Boris, who was really anxious to get rid of the Moon Men, was mixing up a bucket full of Mickey Fins. Oh, goody, punch. Boris, if Moose ever drinks that, he will be asleep for weeks. And we won't get formula from him. Well, here's looking up your ancestors. At that moment, Rocky and his escort were flying just a few hundred feet above the house. I can make it now, fellas. Thanks a lot. And the squirrel headed down for Boris's hideout. Wait, wait, a toast. Oh, sure. Gentlemen, the queen. You said it. No, no. Now we must break glasses. But we ain't drunk the toast yet. In my country, you break glasses before you drink toast. Well, if you say so. But people must get pretty thirsty where you live. Now, I'd like to give a toast. Of course. Uh, well, here's the crime. To, uh, to crime? Of course, that was a toast that Boris and Natasha had to drink. The results were immediate. Hey, she's going to sleep. You fellas don't feel sleepy? Nope. Not even little bitsy bit? Nope. That punch sort of pecks you up. <sighs> Nighty night. And Boris joined Natasha in deep slumber. Party droopers. At that moment, Rocky appeared at the open window. Bullwinkle, there you are. Where else? Are you, Rocky? Come on, we gotta go back. Everybody's looking for you. Oh, that's nice of them. Okay, let's go. Come on, Moon Man. Our friends started back, but just as they left the house, heavy hands fell on their shoulders and a very official voice boomed. You are under arrest by order of the United States government. Our heroes under arrest? Whatever for. Be sure to see our next episode, The Bars and Stripes Forever. Well, that make-believe party that Boris was throwing at his house for the Moon Men developed some unexpected complications. In the first place, after Boris went to all the trouble of mixing up a bucket of Mickey Fins, Bullwinkle gave the wrong toast. Well, here's the crime. And Boris and Natasha had to drink their own sleeping potion. After that, the gathering broke up rather quickly. Party droopers. Then Rocky arrived and convinced Bullwinkle that he ought to return to his own laboratory. But as our friends left the house... You're under arrest by order of the United States government. What for? We have information. There are two spies here. Spies? Who could that be? Pardon my pointing, but it looks like you two. Grab them. But as the special agent grabbed Gidney, Cloyd leveled his scrooch gun, and the agent was instantly frozen solid. Wait a minute. They're not spies. They're visitors from the moon. The moon? Well, that's a job for State Department. But what about those two? They look suspicious. Sir, you are speaking of our hosts. Oh, I'm sure they're all right. They're just a little punchy is all. Come on, Bullwinkle, we gotta get back to the lab. But what about Up the Creek here? We can't just leave him. Oh, he'll be all right. How long did you scrooch him for, Clyde? Only 50 years. 50 years? Kind of a long wait, ain't it? What'll we do? Hey, I got an idea. Listen. And so the next day, there was a special ceremony held in the front of the National Security Building to dedicate a statue of Virus T. Creek, the first special agent to be scrooched in the line of duty. Very few people knew that the statue was really Creek himself, 
with a coat of white paint to keep him in good condition until he became unscrooched 50 years later. And, of course, the real stars of the occasion were the moon men. Everybody wanted to look at them. Oh, they're cute! And in the next few days, the whole country went moon mad. Women immediately adopted the moon man look. Beauty shops specialized in moon man hairdos. Pointed heads were all the rage. Gidney and Cloyd were given the key to the city. Delicious. They even made television commercials. And this is what the moon men looked like after only six weeks at Dick Fanny's. Yeah, we used to look like this. Never have so many been so curious about so few. And pretty soon the pace began to tell on Gidney and Cloyd. They couldn't even eat a meal in peace. Hello, Kirk. Hello, Marilyn. Hello, Governor. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Marilyn. Hello, Roger. Hello, Sophia. Hello, Gidney. Hello, Cloyd. Oh, this has gone far enough. And so one night Rocky and Bullwinkle heard a knock on their door. Come in? Why, it's the moon men. How do you like it here on Earth so far? It's so wonderful we can't stand it anymore. Look, I've got circles under my circles. And from shaking so many hands, look, sagging fingers. So we've got to leave now. Well, Poodaloo. You don't understand. When I say we, I mean all of we. You too. Us? How come? Well, we can't just leave you here to discover the rocket fuel, you know. But I was just now sending out my laundry. Oh, well, I guess they can forward it. Quickly now. And the two moon men marched our friends to the field where they had hidden their strange spacecraft. Get in. I don't suppose we could pay now and fly later. In. I didn't think so. The door slammed shut, and with an unearthly sound, the spaceship with our heroes aboard zoomed straight up. Its destination, the moon. Don't fail to see our next episode. Hello out there, or there's no place like space. While the two moon men, Gidney and Cloyd, were kept busy making personal appearances and signing autographs, Rocky and Bullwinkle were working furiously to rediscover their lost rocket fuel. But time ran out on them when the moon men got tired of all their fame and decided to go home. It's so wonderful we can't stand it anymore. To keep our boys from finding the formula, Gidney and Cloyd made them get into their spaceship and took off for the moon, carrying Rocky and Bullwinkle with them. Up and up the strange craft went, and then suddenly... What is it? I don't know. I'll check the fuel indicator. Is it empty? According to this, we owe it two gallons. Impossible. Stand by to land. With its fuel gone, the spaceship dropped quickly down, down. Bullwinkle, are you all right? Uh, I guess so. Is this the floor where we get off? It sure is. Come on. One moment. You can't scare us with that anymore. If we can't get to the moon, neither can you. You know they're right, Cloyd. You mean we're stuck here? Looks like. I might as well be scrooched. Wait a minute. You know what the rocket fuel formula is, don't you? Well, yes, but... Well, why didn't you tell us and we'll make some for you? Well... What do you got to lose? Well, sure, the worst you can wind up with is a mess of fudge cake. All right, but I certainly wish I knew what happened to our fuel. Well, if Gidney had happened to glance outside, he would have found out right away. For two familiar figures were scurrying off, carrying between them the fuel tank which they had removed from the Moon Men's ship. Well, Boris, we have done it again. I certainly have. We still don't have the formula. Who needs it? We got think of the fuel itself. Now let's check timetable to see what time leaves next submarine. Meanwhile, back in the disabled spaceship, Rocky had just finished reading the formula for the rocket fuel. Well, we can get all the ingredients, I think, except this one. What's that? Mooseberry juice. Mooseberry juice? Heck, that's easy. Oh, not as easy as all that. There's only one place in your whole country where it grows. Where's that? Near a little town called Frostbite Falls. Frostbite, Frostbite Falls. Falls? You know it? Know it? It's our hometown. Yup, right here in Minnesota. Bullwinkle, that's Florida. Well, if they're going to keep adding states all the time, they can't expect me to keep up. Minnesota's up here. Where's Frostbite Falls? I don't see it. Uh, what's the population? Twenty-three. Here, better use this microscope. And while Bullwinkle searched for the location of the country's only mooseberry patch, Boris and Natasha were sitting in a rowboat a couple of miles offshore. Keep your eyes open, Natasha. The submarine should be surfacing any minute. But, darling, how can I see in all this fog? You should have eyes like mine, Natasha. They don't miss one teensy, tiny little thing. Big things, yes, but little things, no. 
All right, you two, get below. It's all yours. You're not coming. You're leaving. He's leaving. I'm staying. Somebody's got to mind the store. And so the two spies carefully stood the explosive rocket fuel and headed the midget submarine across the ocean toward its sinister destination. While our friends were still figuring out how to get to Frostbite Falls, be sure to see our next episode, A Creep in the Deep, or Will Success Spoil Boris Badenov? Last time you remember, Boris and Natasha, those two no-goodniks, stole the secret rocket fuel right off the Moon Men spaceship, took it aboard a submarine, and headed off across the ocean. In the meantime, Rocky had convinced the Moon Men to show him their formula. We can get all these ingredients, I think, except this one. The exception was mooseberry juice, made from the berry of a bush that grew in only one place in the whole country. Near a little place called Frostbite Falls. The boys were delighted to hear this, for Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, was their hometown. Quickly, they started making plans to get the mooseberry juice. But on the submarine... Boris wasn't as cheerful as he could have been. Boris, darling, why so sad? I got feeling there is something I forgot. What could it was? I don't know, but something. Cheer up, darling. When we get back, you will get big medals. Medals I got for burning down orphanage, for kicking small dog, for taking candy from babies. Who needs medals? But still is great day. You're right, Natasha. Send radiogram to central control. Ready? Ready. Quote. Got it. Unquote. For same money, you get eight more words. Okay. At this. Hey, 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 hey. Signed, Boris. Now, what was it I forgot? So Natasha sent a message and an answer came right back. You fool. is for you. Go back and kill Moose. Oh, that's what I forgot. But how can we? It's easy, I'm afraid. We put on breathing apparatus, put sub on automatic pilot, and bail out. Anymore. And while the two spies swam back toward shore, the submarine bearing its precious cargo continued on its way across the ocean. Back in Washington, our heroes were having a rough time getting underway. I'm sorry, sir, but we have no flights to Frostbite Falls, if there is such a place. Oh, yes, we had a train to Frostbite Falls, but they took the tracks up in 1903. We can't help you. The only road into Frostbite Falls is just a cow path. What are we going to do? Time is too important. I know. We'll rent a private plane. Come on, Bullwinkle. We're going to the airport. And in a little while, our boys were talking to the owner of a flying service. In a seat, that'll run you just about $1,000. $1,000? Just to get to Frostbite Falls? You could buy the place for $8 cash. Gee, Bullwinkle, what we need is a good cut-rate pilot. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. Ace Rickenboris at your service. Mein Kart. Ace Rick and Boris, buy air anywhere. Fly now, pray later. <laughs> He's misprint. Haven't I seen your face somewhere before? Of course you have. He's on every $3 bill the government makes. I've never seen a $3 bill. Boy, is my fault you're poor? Come on, do you want to go or not? How much will it cost to take us to Frostbite Falls? You want round trip? Got any square ones? Round trip costs, uh, how much you got? Well, all together, about 85 cents. <laughs> yeah, you lucky kid. Today only special price, 85 cents. Swell! Ready, Bullwinkle? The sooner, the quicker. Then let's go. Oh, Miss Callahan. You called Ace. Who's she? The stewardess, I guess. Okay, all aboard for Frostbite Falls. Please, fasten your seat belts. Well, the wily Boris had done it again. For although our heroes didn't know it, they were only one-way belts, and they were now locked in their seats. Don't miss our next exciting episode, Ace is Wild or the Flying Casket. In their search for Minnesota mooseberries, a vital ingredient of their lost rocket fuel, our heroes left the Moon Men and headed back to Frostbite Falls. They decided to fly and hired a pilot named Ace Rickenboris, who bore a frightening resemblance to Boris Badenov, the notorious spy. The stewardess on the plane was named Miss Callahan, but sounded very much like Natasha Fatale, Boris's partner. Fasten your seat belts, please. I take a size 36. Don't worry, this will fit you perfectly. The boys didn't know it, but those were one-way seat belts, and they were now fastened in their seats permanently. Good evening, everyone. This is your Captain Ace Rick and Boris Pichy. Welcome aboard Flight 13, the flying casket to Frostbite Falls. Miss Callahan will be serving you hot beverage in just a minute. You like hot beverage? My, that was quick. What is it? Specialty of the line, called a guided missile. Guided missile? Yes. 
Just one and you go down in flames. Sounds interesting. Well, he's looking at you. But not for long. Then just as Rocky and Bullwinkle were about to down the lethal drink, the plane hit an air pocket and dropped suddenly. Oh, shucks, we spilled them. As the boys watched, the spilled liquid ate right through the floor of the plane. Make a nice breeze, no? You like a refill? Well, maybe just half a cup. Mm, I don't think we'd better, Bullwinkle. That stuff's a little too strong for us. Meanwhile, the ancient plane was sputtering along, just narrowly avoiding disaster. How are you making out, Natasha? Oh, the little one is too smart for us, Boris. So? Then we jump out and leave him strapped in chair. We'll see how good he is at backseat driving. In the meantime, the submarine carrying a tank of high-explosive fuel stolen by the spies drew nearer and nearer to its destination, a foreign port. Its progress controlled on a radar scope by two mysterious figures. It is exactly on the beam, Gorgi. You said it. What heading? 217 degrees. You sure of these figures? Certainly. That's odd. But I get 216 degrees. What's the matter? You never made me stay? X-ray! Foreign port disappears in mystery blast! As a result of the explosion, an urgent message flashed on the air. Calling Boris Badenov. Calling Boris Badenov. Come in, Boris. The coast is clear. Unaware that their plan to steal the secret fuel had backfired, the two spies were hastening to do away with Rocky and Bullwinkle by sabotaging the airplane. You drained gas tank, Natasha? Check. Threw out extra parachutes? Check. You want me to smash instruments? No, 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 no. Let me. I like to. Oh, I'm just wild about Boris Cha-Cha-Cha. You go ahead, Natasha. I'll catch up with you in a minute. And Natasha leaped out of the plane. Back in the cabin, Bullwinkle was admiring the view when suddenly... Hello there, nice to see ya. Who are you talking to, Bullwinkle? Our stewardess. She just went by in a parachute and... Parachute? parachute? Well, something must be wrong. Here, help me out of my seatbelt. I'm stuck. So am I. Ain't that the darndest luck, though? Luck nothing. I think we've been sabotaged. Meanwhile, in the pilot's compartment, Boris was putting the finishing touches on his job of destruction. He threw out the steering wheel and prepared to jump. I hate to leave a place that holds such pleasant memories. And just then, as our boys struggled with their one-way seatbelts, all three engines conked out. Be sure to see our next exciting episode, The Backseat Divers or Mash Landing. Well, our heroes are really up in the air this time. Searching for mooseberries, a secret ingredient for their rocket fuel formula, they wound up on board a plane piloted by Boris Badenov. His partner, Natasha, fastened them into their seats with one-way belts and then bailed out. In the pilot's compartment, Boris gleefully smashed all the instruments, threw out the steering wheel, and prepared to follow Natasha. I hate to leave a place that holds such pleasant memories. But at that moment, the damaged radio crackled and a voice said, Calling Boris Badenov, this is central control. You reading me? Yes, fearless leader. Plans are changed. Moose must finish finding formula. Do not repeat. Do not kill Moose. Make up your mind. What was that? I said yes, fearless leader. And Boris dashed back into the cabin just as all three engines conked out. Hey, Captain, give us a hand here. Well... Something seems to be the trouble. Get us out of these belts. They're stuck. Of course. How come the engine stopped? Oh, because we're going to land. Well, how come we're landing? Because the engine stopped, you nice little chap. <laughs> we better jump for it. Right, Rocky. Let's go. Wait. No, Bullwinkle. I can glide down, but you need a parachute. I knew I was forgetting something. Moose has got to be saved. Here, take mine. Wouldn't think of it. Take it. I insist. Well, thanks. Come on, Bullwinkle. You sure you don't need it? No, no. We got lots of others that I just threw overboard. Oh, Boris, why didn't you become violinist like Mama wanted? And while our heroes floated earthward, the plane bearing Boris sank lower and lower and finally came to rest on a tall tree. The tree was already occupied. Oh, there you are, darling. I thought you'd never get here. Me too. Hello up there. You all right, Ace? Certainly. We always land this way. It saves wear and tear on the wheels. A short time later, after our boys had rescued the two spies from their precarious perch... Ace, I think you and Miss Callahan better head back for town while Bullwinkle and I push on to... To where? Never mind. He's just a little too curious to suit me, Bullwinkle. 
curious. He's downright odd. Quickly, Natasha, we must follow them. And the two spies began trailing our boys through the woods. Uh, let's see now. As I remember, Mooseberry Island is right this way. Yup, there it is. But look! Well, this was a fine how have you been. Mooseberry Island was surrounded by barbed wire and warning signs. Keep out Mooseberry Blight. Quarantine. Gee, the whole island's off limits. Well, there must be one healthy bush on that island. But how do we get to it? Well, little barbed wire isn't going to stop Bullwinkle J. Moose. I got a scheme. Quickly, Bullwinkle outlined his plan. He would enter the water above the island, swim with the current till he reached it, find a healthy bush, and then swim back below the island. Now you're sure it'll work, Bullwinkle. Of course it will. I thought of every little thing, except one. What's that? I can't swim! And Bullwinkle was carried off by the swift current. Unfortunately, there was another thing that he hadn't figured on. Right below Mooseberry Island was deadly thundering falls. And before Rocky could move, Bullwinkle was swept over the edge. Be with us next time for Bullwinkle's Water Follies or Antlers Away. Well, disaster has dogged the footsteps of our heroes in their search for mooseberries, the missing ingredient for their rocket fuel. First of all, they found that the one mooseberry bush was strictly off limits due to the mooseberry blight. And then finally, Bullwinkle's clever plan to make a swimming raid on the island went slightly awry when he neglected just one little detail. I can't swim! A moment later, Bullwinkle had disappeared over thundering falls. Bullwinkle! As Rocky raced toward the falls, those sly spies, Boris and Natasha, watched from a distance. Is moose kaput, darling? No. Look there, he's caught in bush. Not for long. Do we try to save him or let him go? Uh, which was last orders from headquarters? You took message, darling. But they sent so many. Quickly, get me central control. But while Boris and Natasha tried to get their orders on whether or not to go to Bullwinkle's aid, the intrepid squirrel was already high in a tree next to the falls, carrying a long rope which he tied to a tree limb. Bullwinkle, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. I'm up in this tree. You sure picked the fine time for sightseeing. No, wait. I'm going to glide down with a rope. Okay. And the plucky squirrel trailing the rope behind him launched himself into space. Down he zoomed across the face of Thundering Falls and right to Bullwinkle. Nice flying rock. But at that instant, the bush tore loose. Hang on, Bullwinkle. And with great exertion of mighty moose muscle, Bullwinkle did hang on as he, Rocky, and the bush swung back to the safety of the shore. <sighs> Were you scared, Bullwinkle? Shucks, no. I was as cute as a cucumber, Rocky. Uh, Bullwinkle, I'm over here. That's the bush you're talking to. Imagine me not knowing my best friend from a mooseberry bush. Bullwinkle? Hmm? Say that again. All right. Hmm? No, before that. You said this was a... Just a mooseberry... Mooseberry! Bullwinkle, you did it! You found the last available mooseberry bush in the country! Just my keen eyeballs, I guess. Meanwhile, the two spies had just contacted their superiors overseas. I tell you, I sent whole tank full of rocket fuel by submarine to main seaport. Well, now it's missing. The tank or the rocket fuel? The seaport. Oh, so now I kill moose, right? No, you idiot! Get the formula and return home! We got special reception planned for you. Okay, over and out. Now we gotta get this bush back to Washington, Bullwinkle. Yeah, before it catches the mooseberry blight. But at last we got the secret ingredient. Secret ingredient? Come on, Rocky, let's start hiking. Hold on there, gentlemen. Who are you? Special Agent FPI. You mean FBI? No, FPI, Federal Plant Inspector. You got any peaches, pears, pineapples, passion fruit, papayas, or mooseberries? Well, it just so happens. Aha, a mooseberry bush. And uh, he's crawling with mooseberry blight. It is? This plant must be sprayed right away, quick. Now, wait a minute, you can't... There's no charge. Oh, that's all right, then. So the inspector sprayed and sprayed until not a thing could be seen. <laughs> And when the cloud cleared away, both the bush and the inspector were gone. Boy, that's what I call a powerful spray. Well, what has happened to our mooseberry bush? And does this mean failure to our friends? Heck no! We're the heroes! Don't miss our next episode, The Inspector Detectors, or a kick in the plants!
Well, sir, our heroes are still in a slump in their efforts to bring back a mooseberry bush. For in our last episode, the wily Boris disguised himself as a plant inspector and sprayed the last mooseberry bush in the country. When the cloud of spray was gone, so was the inspector and so was the bush. Boy, that's what I call a powerful spray. Didn't leave leaf nor whisker of either of them. Well, there goes our last chance of getting a mooseberry bush back to Washington. You mean... Yeah, we failed. <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's just some engines gone by in a canoe. But if that canoe had been closer, the boys would have seen that it didn't hold Indians at all, but Boris and Natasha, and between them, the mooseberry bush. But Rocky and Bullwinkle were too concerned with how to get back to Washington. Can't fly back. Our planes crashed. Check. Can't walk back. Take too long. Check. Can't go by boat. Haven't got a boat. Check. Wait a minute. Sure we got a boat. We have? Yeah, right up in that fir tree. Oh, sure, Rocky. Poor kid's been in the woods too long. He's fur crazy. No, look! Rocky, that's our wrecked airy plane. Not for long. Come on. And so a short time later... You see, Natasha? He's like taking candy from baby. You know, darling, I have funny feeling we're being followed. Followed? Who could follow us? <laughs> we stole the only canoe on the river. It's just him, but... Sure enough, they were being followed. Rocky and Bullwinkle had turned their smashed aeroplane into a boat and the plane's propellers made excellent double-bladed paddles. They, they're gaining on us. Like taking candy from baby, huh? Eh? You ever tried to take candy from baby? It's pretty hard. But Rocky and Bullwinkle, with no telescope, didn't know that they were so close to their goal. They'd have been even more dejected had they known what was coming, for just around the next bend in the river, Boris was planning a rather unpleasant surprise. There, we should get rid of those two idiots. But your last instructions say do not kill moose. Who's killing moose? <laughs> I'm just chopping down tree. It's my fault he happens to be underneath. Shh, here they come. And Boris started the huge tree on its way down. You aren't even going to holler, Timber? Of course I am. Listen. Timber. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle! Look! The enormous tree hurtled down at our heroes. But unfortunately for Boris, it was just a little too big. It fell all the way across the river and hit a cliff on the other side. But the force of its falling snapped it in two, and half the tree drove through the bottom of Rocky's makeshift canoe. We're leaking, Rocky! How are we going to get rid of that thing? We're not, Bullwinkle! That's a mast! With pine cones on it? Sure. The wind blowing through the tree makes it act like a big sail. Well, I'll be a moose. You are a moose. Yeah, I wanted something easy. We'll be in Washington in no time. Yep, if we don't sink first. So with Rocky in the crow's nest and Bullwinkle at the tiller, the strange craft sped down the river. Natasha, this requires quick thinking and positive action. What we're going to do? Run like rabbits. Come on. And a moment later, Boris's canoe started downriver with a furious burst of speed. Faster, Natasha, faster. Stroke, stroke, stroke. And so began the strangest boat race ever held, the cross-country canoe contest from Minnesota to Washington, D.C. Will our boys catch up with the spies before their sort of boat sort of sinks? Don't miss our next episode, Canoes Who? Or Look Before You Leak. Well, the big overland canoe race is on. Boris and Natasha, with a priceless mooseberry bush, are fleeing just a few miles ahead of Rocky and Bullwinkle in their remodeled leaky airplane. Starting at Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, the two vessels race through a couple of the largest Great Lakes. Stroke, stroke, stroke! Bail, bail, bail! Then, as they ran out of water, they carried their canoes on a portage through Chicago. Which way to Fort Wayne? That way. Thanks! Oh, excuse me. Sorry. And a little while later, watchers of the Gold Cup powerboat race a couple of hundred miles away were awed when the number one speedboat was overtaken by not one, but two boats. Stroke, stroke, stroke! Bail, bail, bail! Hold it, Bullwinkle! Boy, that was close. Almost bailed out the captain. How are we doing? That leak's gaining on me. We better get where we're going in a hurry. We will if the wind holds out. Bail, bail, bail. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Boris, Boris. Huh? Boris, when is your half of paddling going to start? Don't worry, I'll do my half. Now stroke, stroke, stroke. A short time later at the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, a bell rang to signal that a ship wanted to get through. All right, but there ain't no ship there. Stroke, stroke, stroke. See, a canoe full of Indians just went by here. I don't care if you believe it. I just saw... Bail, 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 bail! Never mind. This one I don't believe myself. 
Soon the two vessels had run out of large bodies of water. They began to travel in small rivers or creeks, in irrigation ditches. Anywhere there was even a trace of water, they sailed on and on and on. Stroke, stroke, stroke! Bail, bail, bail! Sort of like riding on a soggy freeway, ain't it? Crowds began to gather to watch them go by. Here they come! Stroke, 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 stroke. Bail, 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 bail. They went through city parks. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Bail, bail, bail. They went through amusement parks. Have a nice ride, folks. <laughs> I sure did. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Bail, bail, bail. They even got through some places without carrying their boats. Look out, Eddie. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Bail, bail, bail. And finally, on one foggy evening as they approached Washington, D.C., only a few yards separated them. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Bail, bail, bail. Stroke, stroke. Bail, bail, stroke. Hmm, there's quite an echo. Bail! Stroke! Bail! Stroke! That's the first echo I ever heard that wrote its own dialogue. Boris, when is your half of paddling going to start? Any mile now, Natasha. Psh, I think they're right behind us. Gee, it sure is foggy. Yeah, can't see my nose in front of my face. Of course, that's quite a distance. <laughs> You hear that? Is the squirrel and moose. They mustn't catch us. Just then, Boris's canoe bumped into a warning sign. Straight ahead only, no left turn. Dangerous sawmill. Sawmill, eh? Now we play little word game with that sign. What game is that? You heard of Russian roulette? Yes. This is Russian Scrabble. And so when our heroes came to the sign, they turned left toward the sawmill. And a moment later, the stillness was broken by a hideous sound. Have our friends really run into more than they can handle? Don't miss our next episode, too, for the ripsaw, or goodbye, Mr. Chips. Well, it's been a rough canoe trip for Rocky and Bullwinkle, and it looks even rougher ahead, for in the fog, they sailed right into... Pokey smoke, a sawmill! Hang on, Rocky! And as our heroes sat petrified, the whirling saw blade cut their frail craft right in two. Fortunately, they were on opposite sides of the boat and escaped unscathed but they were immediately seized by the sawmill machinery and became part of a soapbox assembly line. Hey, let me out! You can't do this to me! You know, Edward, I could swear them boxes was talking. Now look, Chauncey, boxes is made of wooden nails, right? Right. Wooden nails cannot talk, right? Right. Ergo, a soapbox cannot talk, right? Right. Okay. Okay, now explain it to him. Hey, Bullwinkle, look at the address on the crate. To Congressman Drupalton Bun, Washington, D.C. Yes, fortunately for our heroes, an election was coming up for Congressman Bun, and he had ordered a shipment of soap boxes to make speeches from. Hey, Congressman! Great green gravy. It's the missing scientists, and you're back in one piece. You were expecting maybe installments? Meanwhile, a short distance away, a familiar canoe was shooting down the Potomac. Stroke, stroke, stroke. Natasha, you poor little thing, you must be tired. Here, take megaphone. It's finally my turn to pedal. About time to straw. What do you know? We're here. Boris, you said you'd paddle halfway. I did, I did. It's just your half was bigger than my half, you lucky kid. And the two spies made their way to a lonely dock where a solitary figure gazed out over the ocean. Oh, Captain Plapov, when leaves next submarine? You didn't hear. Submarine is kaput. Well, that shop is. You got orders from Central Control? You bet. They send these. What are they? Water wings. One of us must swim back. Swim? But who? Well, let's do things fair with square. We'll draw straws for it. Long straw gets to swim, okay? Okay, I'll take first one. Ooh, he's short. Natasha? Also short. Well, looks like you're it, Captain. Have nice trip. And the unlucky Captain started on his 3,000-mile swim. Boris, darling, weren't you afraid you'd lose? <laughs> Not as long as I have telescoping straw. Well, so let's buy boat ticket and go back home. Buy ticket and go back home? Natasha, where is your pride, your professional integrity? We steal tickets and go back home. Meanwhile, our heroes return to their laboratory in something less than triumph. Do you really think people are mad at us for losing the Mooseberry Bush Rock? Listen! Boo! 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 Sounds like feeding time at the zoo. There's one of them! Look out, Bullwinkle! 
Boy, they give us everything but another chance. What are we going to do? We just got to think hard, Bullwinkle. Oh, there must be an easier way than that. And while our boys pondered their problem, the two spies in another part of the city were all set to get their return boat tickets from the Transocean Travel Agency. That was quick, darling. Of course. I always do business with Transocean. Come on. And the two spies hurried toward New York City, where a huge liner was getting ready to sail. Don't miss our next exciting episode. Farewell, my ugly, or nuts to you. Well, our heroes certainly aren't feeling like heroes these days. For they lost the mooseberry bush, and with it, their chance to rediscover their secret rocket fuel. Gee, if we just knew where there was another bush. But we don't. We ain't moon men, you know. Bullwinkle, that's it. The moon men. Where, where? I mean, they know where there was another bush. Hey, that's pretty smart. I wish I'd thought of that. You did. Then how come you said it? Come on, let's find them. But when our friends called on the moon men at their New York apartment, they were gone, and nobody knew where. Well, it was a good idea. Yeah, even if I did think of it. But just then, Rocky spotted a theatrical newspaper that gave them a clue to the moon men's whereabouts. Moon men, Socko, in lost wages. Lunar ticks 20G click at sands. What do you suppose it means in English? I don't know, I'll ask. Uh, pardon me, what does that mean? You kidding, Jack? Why are the biggest B.O. draws in showbiz? Floor them in Philly, pulverize them in podunk, this in Seish, way out, in a word, buffo. Thanks. What's it mean? He wouldn't tell me. But eventually our friends did find someone to translate the headlines for them. Hmm, according to our computer, your friends have a fairly successful show in Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas? Sure enough, the Moon Men had gone into show business as a song and dance team. Me and my shadow All alone and feeling blue, blue, blue be doo Listen to that, Gidney. They love us. Telephone, Mr. Cloyd. Thanks. Okay, lay it on me. Cloyd, this is Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Rocky doll, how are you? Rocky doll? It's been ages, sweetie. Where have you been keeping? Gee, he sure sounds funny. Let me talk to him. Hello there. Bullwinkle, baby. Baby? I'm six foot two in my stocking hoofs. What? Can't hear a thing, lover. The applause is deafening. Here, Gid, I'll quiet him down. And now, folks, a brief intermission. And of course, as soon as Cloyd fired his scrooge gun, the whole audience was frozen solid. You went what? Another mooseberry bush. Oh, oh, yes. Well, there is one other place. Swill, let me write it down. Yes? Yes? Come on, Gidney. They're only scrooged for a minute or so. Oh, we'd love to help you, Rocky, but we're booked solid for the next three years. Frankie asked us to follow Judy at the palace, you know. There they go. What'll we give him, Floyd? Some real moon song. How about Shine on Harvest Earth? Oh, that's kooky. And one and two and shine, shine on, shine on, on Harvest Earth up, up in, in the sky. sky. So Gidney and Cloyd resumed their theatrical careers, while a little later on a pier in New York City... Where are we going, Rock? There's only one other place on Earth to find most berries, and we're going there. Where's there? A country called Pottsylvania. And at that instant, just around the corner... You got good tickets, darling. Of course. Anything worth stealing is worth stealing. Well, first-class cabin. And then nobody better try stop us. So the two spies are headed for the same place as our heroes, Pottsylvania. And what will happen if either of the parties spots the other? Don't miss our next episode, Cheerful Little Peerful, or Bomb Voyage. Well, it seems that fate has taken a hand in the game of Mooseberry, Mooseberry, Who's Got the Mooseberry? For Rocky and Bullwinkle and the two spies are all getting ready to sail to the same place, Pottsylvania. Yeah, because that's the only place in the world to get mooseberry. But Boris and Natasha, posing as tourists, seem to be carrying coals to Newcastle, for they are taking a mooseberry bush to Pottsylvania. Or are they? Sorry, Ms. O'Brien. You can't take that Aspidistra with you. He's not Aspidistra, he's a reed. Shh, don't argue with me, Mikushla. Of course he's Aspidistra, asp uh, what he said. Why couldn't we take it? Regulations, no plants can go abroad. We're on the lookout for a stolen mooseberry bush. Well, maybe your sister can be plant seeder for but us. But I don't have... This way. Boris, what are we going to do? I'll think of something. But a hurry, look. Sure enough, our heroes were headed right for them. Quick, Natasha, put this on your head. On my head? Hurry. Okay, officer, we go on board now. Now, just a minute, Mr. O'Brien. 
What's that? That big gory is my wife's new hat. They get crazier every year, ain't? Looks more like a bush to me. Sir, you are criticizing my wife's taste? Is that really a hat, lady? Oh, you think I would wear anything this ridiculous if it wasn't a hat? Uh, I guess not. Go ahead. And the two spies left just as Rocky and Bullwinkle entered the room. I could swear I'd seen those two somewhere before. Anything to declare? Yeah, I declare I've seen them too. They're right behind us. What do we do? Get orders from central control, of course. But how? Radio's packed in trunk. You fool, Nateshi. Luckily, Boris Bedinov is always ready for emergency. Meet Dimitri. Dimitri? He's carrier pigeon. But pigeon is too slow. Oh, uh, not this one. He's only jet pigeon in world. And quickly, Boris wrote a note, attached it to the pigeon, and sent it on its way. Just a few moments later, Dimitri arrived at spy headquarters overseas and delivered Boris's message. But unfortunately, the jet speed had blown off all his feathers, and he couldn't make the return flight. We must contact Badenov by radio. So a moment later... Calling Boris Badenov. Hello, Boris. Who said that? His radio in trunk. Return with Mooseberry Bush. Shh. Bring Bush to headquarters. Quiet! Uh, anything the matter, sir? Oh, yeah, Captain Pitch Falls. No, no, he's fine. Make report to G1. Uh, what's that? Uh, it's me. I went willing to... to I, I throw my voice. Use code 3. Say, that's great. I couldn't see your lips move at all. Oh, it's nothing. Make report Tuesdays and Thursdays. You must join the ship's concert. Glad to, glad to. Quick, Natasha, into the cabin. And the spies dashed into their cabin just as Rocky and Bullwinkle started up the gangplank. Well, we're off to Pottsylvania, Bullwinkle. Yeah, nice of all these people to come see us off. Oh. Hello, fearless leader. What we do about moose? You sure you got secret ingredient? Right here. Good. Then for moose... You heard me. Boris, look, coming up gangplank is moose and squirrel. Meh, <laughs> what magnificent luck. Somebody down there likes me. Sure enough, the gangplank went just past the spy's cabin, and in an instant, Boris had snipped the cables that held it up. Look out, Bowwinkle! And the gangplank plummeted down between the ship and the dock. On the bridge of the liner, Captain Peach Fuzz was all at sea. Get, the, get them out of there before they're squashed. He's just a little late for that. Oh, you beautiful doll, you great big beautiful doll. And as the crowd watched horrified, the huge liner slowly swung closer and closer to the dock and nearer and nearer to squashing our heroes. Don't miss our next episode, Summer Squash, or he's too flat for me. Well, Rocky and Bullwinkle are up to their necks in trouble, and in water, too, for Boris Badenov dumped them into the harbor and a huge ocean liner began to squeeze them against the dock. It's coming closer, Rock. Up on the bridge, Captain Peter Peach Fuzz, with his customary efficiency, was giving a series of conflicting orders. Uh, uh, haul the hawser, hat ahead, uh, full, full astern, batten the hatch, bloop the bleep, smartly now. But still the ship inched inward. I can't hold it off, Rock. I'm folding up like an acorn bean. The crowd gasped, for now there was only one thing between our heroes and disaster, Bullwinkle's antlers. Will I hold, Bullwinkle? It ain't the antlers I'm worried about. It's that space in between. Here, catch this rope. But in the excitement, Captain Peach Fuzz let the rope go on the wrong side of the ship. Fortunately, it caught on a passing speedboat, and slowly but surely, the liner was pulled outward. A moment later, the boys were being hauled aboard the SS Andalusia in a cargo net. Everybody was overjoyed at the rescue. Well, almost everybody. Dear diary, today I killed off moose and squirrel. Weather continues fair. Boris, look, they're safe. Raskolnikov. Now I got to erase whole page. Well, the Andalusia finally got underway. For two days, the two spies remained hidden in their cabin. Then one morning... Boris, Boris, look at mooseberry bush. Sure enough, the mooseberry bush looked terrible. Its leaves had lost their luster, its branches drooped sadly. The spies quickly summoned the ship's doctor. It's simple. This plant is seasick. Seasick? Yes, I recommend you get it out in the air and sunshine. A few quick turns around the deck every day should do the trick. But that wasn't as simple as it sounded. Look, he's moose and squirrel. Hide quick. And the spies ducked out of sight as our heroes passed. All clear, Natasha. Ah, they are bound to find us sooner or later, Boris. Come, come, come. We'll think of a way. And so the next time Rocky and Bullwinkle came around the corner of the deck, they saw three new passengers in deck chairs. Hello there, fellow sailors. Are you having a bonbon voyage? He's bit of all right, old chappy. Pip, pip. In all that sort of rat. Say, you must be English. <laughs> well, I guess our little secret is out, my dear. Allow me to introduce myself. Sir Thomas Lippin Boris at your service. Not Sir Thomas Lippin Boris, the millionaire yachtsman. Of course, old boy. See, it says so on card. 
And this is my wife, Lady Alice. Howdy! Charmed, I'm sure, darling. And this is my uncle Chamandyali, pronounced Chamli. Hi, I'm Rocky, and this is Bullwinkle. Pronounced the binky. Sorry, chaps, Uncle Chamli is taking nap right now. Looks like a keen idea. Well, then why don't you have lie down, old chappy? Here, use my chair. We will take walk around deck with your little friend. Well, that's mighty thoughty of you. Boris, you're leaving Moose with Uncle Chumley? Of course. Then Squirrel go with us. And when we're alone, me, <laughs> you get it? <laughs> I get it. So will Squirrel. Come along now. Last one around the deck is a saggy crumpet. And as Rocky went trustingly into the dark shadows of the boat deck with Boris and Natasha, Bullwinkle lay down next to Uncle Chumley. But when a stray breeze blew away the handkerchief over Uncle Chumley's face, it wasn't a person at all but the mooseberry bush in disguise. Will Bullwinkle catch on for once? And what about Rocky, all alone with Sir Thomas and Lady Alice? Don't miss our next episode, The Earl and the Squirrel, or The March of Crime. Well, that mighty monarch of the seas, the SS Andalusia, is plowing on her way to Pottsylvania, home of the mysterious mooseberry bush. Little does Bullwinkle know as he basks in the sunshine that right beside him is the very bush our heroes are seeking, disguised as Sir Thomas Lippenboris, Uncle Chomley. Nice day, ain't it? Must be beef. I say it's a nice day! He ain't beef, but he's pretty dumb. Meanwhile, Rocky has started for a turn around the deck with Sir Thomas and Lady Alice, who bear a striking resemblance to his old enemies, Boris and Natasha. Come on, Sir Thomas. The sea air is wonderful. I say, slow down a bit, old plum pudding. We must catch a spot of bread, eh, what? Okay. How's this? But the pace that Rocky said was still too fast for the spies, and as much as they wanted to get near him, he was always just a little too far ahead. Boris, I can't go on. What's the matter? My feet are killing me. I am used to high heels. The shoes are too comfortable. I can't stand them. Come on, Sir Thomas. Can't right now, old bean. Just remember, it's time for tea. Cheerio. Okay, I'll see you later. Gee, he's a nice guy for a duke. Back at the deck chair, Bullwinkle was still trying to start up a conversation with Uncle Chumley. So this other fella says, that's funny, you don't look Chinese. <laughs> Ain't that a... Well, maybe not. Thinks he's so smart, won't even laugh at my jokes. Okay, don't talk. See if I care. You're just a sore head, and I'll tell you to your face, too. And Bullwinkle pulled away the handkerchief over Uncle Chumley's face. Uh-oh. That there is a mighty sick uncle. Look at that face. It's green. Covered with little red spots, too. I wonder if he's catching. A short distance away, Sir Thomas was gleefully boring holes in the bottom of a lifeboat. Did I ever tell you, Natasha, I got a medal in drilling holes at USC? University of Southern California? No, Ukrainian safe-cracking college. Rocky! Rocky! What is it, Bullwinkle? It's Uncle Chumley. He's got a bad case of the red and green uglies and... Rocky, listen. Just at that moment, a loud bell began to ring close at hand. Lifeboat drill, lifeboat drill. Take your stations, take your stations. What is it, Rock? It's lifeboat practice, Bullwinkle. Come on, this is our boat. Mooses and squirrels first. Women and children next. Let's get in. Gee, it's getting foggy. Little did our friends know that the voice on the speaker was that of Sir Thomas Lippenboris, who waited just out of sight with a pair of cable snippers. Wait a minute. What about poor old Uncle Chumley? Get him, Bullwinkle. In an instant, the moose had grabbed the disguised mooseberry bush and dashed back into the lifeboat. Don't worry, Uncle Chumley. You're safe with us. Oh, he won't answer. Just sits there like a vegetable. All set in number five? All set. That's nice. And the wily spy cut the cables holding the lifeboat on its dagger. Hey, help, help! Moose overboard! And a moment later, Sir Thomas Lippenboros was waving farewell to the leaky lifeboat as it drifted away in the fog. Cheerio, Moose. Goodbye, Squirrel. Peep-peep, Uncle Chomley. did he... Uncle Chomley. Boris, what have you done? Don, I've destroyed my own flesh and bush. Well, our heroes have the mooseberry bush, but what good is it a thousand miles from nowhere? Listen tomorrow for a drift in the mist or fog groggy. Well, our heroes are all at sea, for Boris Badenov has tricked them into a leaky lifeboat, cut the cables, and watched them drift away in the fog. 
Little does he know that the boys have taken the priceless mooseberry bush with them, disguised as an old gentleman named Uncle Chumley. Hey, Bull Winkle, this boat is leaking. You know I got the same sneaky feeling? We gotta find something to plug up the hole. I got this one stopped. Yeah, but what about that one? You might lend a hand, Uncle Chumley, instead of just sitting there. Bull Winkle, I got an idea. What is it? Stand on your head. Is that your idea of an idea? Quick, we can use your antlers as plugs. Sure enough, as fate would have it, when Bullwinkle stood on his head, the points of his antlers just fit the holes in the bottom of the boat. It's working, Bullwinkle. You stopped the leak. Show us what you can do if you just use your head. Now all we have to do is wait for the SS Andalusia to find us. Well, I hope they hustle it up. My brains are getting soggy. Don't worry. They'll pick us up in a couple of minutes. Rocky wouldn't have been so confident if he knew more about the Andalusia, for she was under the command of Captain Peter Peachfuzz, the world's worst sailor. Even as a youth, Peter Peachfuzz had wanted to be a captain but something always went wrong. At 18, Peter joined the Navy, where due to his sailing through the Panama Canal in the wrong direction, he wound up in command of the only icebreaker in the South Seas. Half ahead, port! Stand by to jettison the supercargo! Teddy Canoe and Tyler, too! On the double! His seamanship won him scores of medals, all donated by the enemy. And a nickname was bestowed on him by his grateful shipmates, Wrong Way Peach Fuzz. After his military service, he assumed command of a smaller vessel plying the coastal waters. Then one day, a maiden aunt died and left him a hundred million dollars. Of course, Peter's first act was to buy the SS Andalusia and hire himself as captain. His second act was to run right into the Brooklyn Bridge. Hard as stern! Block that kick! Next day, after he tried to sail the Andalusia up 42nd Street to Times Square, his officers held a special meeting. He's a mutton-headed idiot. Couldn't command a boat in a bathtub. He's a bird brain. He's a bird lover. I'll resent that. Yes, gentlemen, he is an incompetent nincompoop. He really has only one qualification. What's, What's that? that? He's the captain. But we've got to do something. I think I have a plan. And so late that night, the officers watched as the ship's carpenter quietly disconnected the captain's <laughs> steering wheel and telegraph. Of course, Peach Fuzz never noticed the change. Way aloft! Hold that line! But the ship was actually run from another set of controls on a lower deck. Unfortunately, while all the other officers were searching for our heroes, Captain Peach Fuzz made a wrong turn and wound up in the right room. The result was instant panic. The Andalusia spun around in circles and then started off at full speed in all directions at once. You hear that, Bullwinkle? Won't be long now. Hey, here we are. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, get off. The steamer's heading right for us. Look out. And the tremendous bulk of the SS Andalusia swept past without even slowing down. Boy, that was too close for comfort. Yeah, if I ever catch the nitwit who's steering that boat, I... Nothing personal, you understand? Look out, Bullwinkle, here she comes again. This time she's really gonna run us down. And sure enough, the knife-like prow of the huge ocean liner struck the lifeboat squarely in the middle. Don't miss our next episode, The Deep Six, or The Old Moose and the Sea. You remember that last time our heroes found themselves in a leaky lifeboat dodging a runaway ocean liner. One time they forgot to duck and the sharp bow of the steamship struck their tiny craft right in the middle. When it passed, there was nothing left of the lifeboat but splinters. Fortunately, Bullwinkle had been able to grab onto part of the ship's anchor and our heroes dangled far above the waves as the liner plowed on. Meanwhile, in their cabin, Boris and Natasha were very despondent. Boris, how could you let them sail away with the mooseberry bush? Bush was disguised as old men. Did I know they'd help old men into lifeboat? I wouldn't. Help! It seems to me I still hear that idiotic voice calling, Moose overboard! Look, outside porthole! His ghost! No, it's Bullwinkle! Who is it, Bullwinkle? It's that very nice English-type fella, Sir Thomas Lippenboris. Well, tell him we got his Uncle Chumley here. Uncle Chumley? Quick, Natasha, get help. And a few moments later, our friends were hauled on board. Uncle Chumley! This is a bit of all right, what? Let us take you to cabin, darling. He's sure a brave old fella. Didn't hear a peep out of him the whole time. Hey, what's happening? Abandoned ship! Captain Peach Fuzz is at the wheel! Sure enough, Captain Peter Wrongway Peach Fuzz, the world's worst sailor, gained entrance to the real control room and was now in full command. Full speed astern ahead! Port your helm! Knit one, hurl two! 
Hang on, Bullwinkle. Looks like a rough trip. Yeah, and I wonder where to. Bullwinkle wasn't the only one concerned about that, for the Andalusia was long overdue at her destination. Nobody knew exactly where she was. Well, I'm calling. Andalusia just passed here, headed south. Uh, I mean north. I mean... Oh, never mind. Commander, I think I've got a ship on the radar. Nonsense. Nobody would steer a ship like that. The radar's out of order. But the commander had reckoned without Captain Peach Fuzz, who could and did steer a ship exactly like that. Gee, Bullwinkle, we should be getting near Pottsylvania by now. Land ho! Oh, boy, we're Pottsylvania at last. Yeah, I could tell because of the windmills and all them tulips. Windmills? Tulips? That's Holland. But at that moment, Captain Peach Fuzz was picking a new course. Aha! Come right 200 degrees centigrade. Psst. Reef the forecastle. Play ball. And the steamer headed off to sea again at full speed. Radio messages crackled round the world. Hello, Andalusia. This is the Coast Guard calling. Come in. But unfortunately, Captain Peach Fuzz kept his radio tuned to another station entirely. And in the National League, it's Dodgers 3, Cards 2. And in their cabin, our heroes waited for the boat to dock anywhere. Hey, Rock, I think we're there. What do you see? Oh, there's a whole lot of people waiting on the shore. Looks like a formal reception. Formal? Yup. Everybody's wearing tuxedos. Oh, Bullwinkle, those are penguins. We must be near the South Pole. Whoa, we better ask for another blanket. But keeping from freezing wasn't the only problem facing our heroes, for as they sat down to dinner that evening, they found with a shock that their food had run out. Bullwinkle, if we don't make port soon, we'll die of malnutrition. I'd rather starve first. Will our heroes end up wasting away to ocean-going shadows? Don't miss our next episode, The Slippery Helm or Captain's Outrageous. Well, the ocean liner bearing our heroes is still sort of lost at sea with Captain Wrongway Peach Fuzz at the helm. They have gone more miles and got less places than any ship in the world. X3 Andalusia approaches by them, boy! Work Street, Andalusia hits, point them, boy. Damage great. And to make things even worse, the ship has now run out of food. Boy, am I ever hungry. Yeah, me Just too. Just looking at pictures of food makes my mouth water. Mm -hmm. Oh, Uncle, what are you eating? I just couldn't resist the picture, Rocky, so I ate it. Okay, give me a page. Here's a fruit salad with cottage cheese. Mmm, delicious. Here, have a picture of standing rib roast in full color. Mmm. How is it? Well, I really like it a little more well done. Meanwhile, in the cabin just next door... Boris, Mooseberry Bush has lost the will to live. What are we going to do? Get me central control. Hello, fearless leader. This is Boris Bedinov, your friendly neighborhood spy speaking. Come in, friendly. Bush is in bed shape. What do we do? Who needs Bush, you idiot? All we need whoa, are whoa, moose whoa, berries. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Natasha, quick. Big berries. Shall I keep this one, Boris? No, it's too little. Throw it away. Boris, what happened? Remember, pit moose berries are very explosive. Do not shake, rattle, or roll. Now you tell us. Boris, how we're going to keep moose berries safe? Easy. You sit here, I sit here, Mooseberry sit there. But Boris had reckoned without Captain Peach Fuzz, who at that moment decided to change course. Hard up port! Course 54, 40, or fight! Boris, look! As the boat heeled over, the closely guarded Mooseberries skidded toward the porthole and out. Hmm? Oh, boy. Must be snack time. Hmm. You! Howdy, Sir Thomas. Are they yummy? Those, those berries, they're... Oh, yeah, they're delicious. Want to see me throw one up and catch it in my mouth? No! Oh, it's easy. <laughs> Gee, these got kind of a kick to him. Boris, he's fainted. Anything wrong, Lady Alice? Oh, no, no, no. He's just the heat. The heat? I ain't been this cold since I left Frostbite Falls. Oh, whoa, whoa, don't whoa. shiver, don't shiver. If Moose jiggles those berries, we all go boom. Come in, old pipsqueak. Have a warm in our cabin. Well, I don't mind if I... Oop! Must have tripped on the rug. We don't got a rug. Oh, nice place you got here. It's kind of... <laughs> what is it? I guess I got the hiccups. <laughs> Water, quick. Best cure for hiccups, old chippy. 
So Boris and Natasha tried every known hiccup remedy and cure available. Ice water, hot water, more ice water, head in the bag, holding the breath. How about standing on my head? No! no. <laughs> what do we do? What else? We scare him. Oh, that poor little fellow. What's that? Your little friend Rocky just fell overboard. Rocky! And Bullwinkle went flying out of the cabin, tripped on the door sill, catapulted over the rail, and still stuffed with explosive, plummeted toward the deck 30 feet below. Don't fail to see our next episode, Bullwinkle Makes a Hit, or I Get a Bang Out of You. You remember last time that when Bullwinkle accidentally ate the mooseberries, he was turned into a regular living bomb. Then hearing a false rumor that Rocky had fallen overboard, he dashed for the door, tripped over it, and hurtled over the ship's rail toward the deck 30 feet below. Luckily for the moose, the ship's swimming pool was directly underneath. Not so darn lucky! I can't swim! With a mighty splash, the moose hit the water, and an instant later there was a tremendous explosion. And an ominous cloud hung over the pool. Bullwinkle, you all right? Sure, why not? Yes, fortunately, the explosion had blown all of the water out of the pool and Bullwinkle was left high and dry and feeling fine. Except for a slight upset stomach. What was that big bang I heard? Must have been my stomach being upset. <laughs> well, darling, there goes 14 episodes of effort up in smoke. Oh, Natasha, sometimes I get so mad I could go straight. Go straight? Yeah, straight to central control and ask for race. Camino, great one. While Boris tried to raise central control and his salary, the SS Andalusia was continuing her erratic course under the command of Captain Wrongway Peach Fuzz, the world's worst sailor. Left rudder, now right rudder, now the other rudder. Lay forward, splice the main brace. We gotta do something about Captain Peach Fuzz, Bullwinkle. Yeah, I'm getting busy from traveling in circles. Hey, look, there he is. What's he doing? That's a sextant. He's plotting our course. Well, Captain, just where are we? Glad you asked. According to my accurate figures, we're just a little bit south of the North Pole. Well, that doesn't sound like an Eskimo song to me. They made exactly polar bears, neither. Hmm, Sextant must be a little off. Aren't we sailing a little close to shore, Captain? Oh, of course not. The water here is 50 fathoms deep. Of course, that's at high tide. Sure enough, the huge liner had run aground on a tiny tropic isle. A lucky thing, in a way, for the ship had run out of food and the passengers were famished. Do you suppose there's anything to eat on the island? I think so. Looky there. Sam's quick lunch and barbecue. Poi burgers, pineapple pizza, shrimp cheesecake. Boy, that sounds great. Let's go, Captain. And Rocky, Bullwinkle, and Captain Peach Fuzz set out on the ship's boat to pick up supplies. Forward, men. Captain, the shore's that way. Oh, of course. My map was upside down. Boris, look, he's moose and squirrel. He's always moose and squirrel. I get so tired of those two. Well, this is your chance to get rid of them. They are leaving for island. And that's the captain with them. Oh, boy. Then who is in charge of ship? Natasha, you foolish girl. Meet that old salty dog, Barnacle Boris Bedinov. Boris, you wouldn't steal whole ocean liner. <laughs> In this business, Honeybone, you got to think big. Sure enough, no sooner had our friend set foot on the tiny island than... Pokey smoke, Captain! Look at your boat! Gee, it's floating away! You can't leave without me. I'm the captain. The red sails in the sunset, the ba ba boo 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 Well, is this the end of Rocky and Bullwinkle's trip to Pottsylvania? Don't fail to see our next episode, Three on an Island, or Tell It to the Maroon. Well, our hero's sea voyage has come to an abrupt halt where they've been stranded in mid-ocean on tiny Blowney Island. They think their boat has simply drifted away, but in reality it has been stolen by, who else, Boris Badenov. Barnacle Boris Bedinov, if you please. Well, looks like we're stuck here, Captain Peach Fuzz. We'd better explore the island. Forward, men. Um, you're heading out to sea, Captain, this way. Well, anyways, we won't starve. There's a keen poi burger stand. Yeah, and I could sure use a bite to eat. I could use several myself. Alas, when our friends tried to buy a poi burger, they ran into complications. Poi burgers, ten clamshells each. How much is that in dollars? No dig, lucky bucks. 
What's that mean? I think he means he won't accept American money. Well, this must be the only place in the world that don't. Hey, how about trading a poi burger for my favorite yo-yo? No dig yo-yo. It glows in the dark. No dig yo-yo. Green stamps, maybe? No dig green stamps. What do you dig? Dig clams. Meanwhile, far at sea, Boris was blithely heading the SS Andalusia toward Pottsylvania. <laughs> Wait till they hear I've stolen hundred million dollar ocean liner. Hello, chief. Make my bed. Light the light. I'll arrive late tonight. Bye bye, Black Boris. Bad enough, you bring back mooseberries? Well, no, they got sort of... You bring back mooseberry bush? He didn't do so well, let's see, we had to... You bring back moose? Not exactly, he's back in... Then what are you bringing back? Hundred million dollar ocean liner. You imbecile, who needs ocean liner? I thought it might be nice for kids, keep them off the street, you know. You nitwit, how can we make rocket fuel with ocean liner? His brand new bow. Go back and get moose. Twin smokestacks. Immediately. Yes, fearless leader. And Boris reluctantly started the SS Andalusia back toward the island. Meanwhile, our friends were all hard at work digging clams on the beach, all except for Captain Peach Fuzz, who couldn't find the beach. Forward! Can't be far now. Right this way. We're almost there. Find any clams yet, Bullwinkle? Nope, but I think I'm getting warm. I just hit something. I hope it's a clam. I'm getting awful hungry. No, it ain't a clam. It... Then forget about it, Bullwinkle. Okay, if you say so, Rob. Ahoy! Ahoy the island! Bullwinkle, look! It's the Andalusia! She's back! And look who's at the wheel! Shiro and Pip Pip all been back! It's Sir Thomas Lippenburst, the millionaire yachtsman! We're saved! Yeah, but we still don't have any food! Why not let me dicker with the natives? They're really very simple people! And so Captain Peach Fuzz worked out a shrewd deal with the proprietor of the stand. You put Lucky Box that side, I put Poi Burgers this side. Of course, this did make the food a little expensive. Eat slow, Martha. I figure these are costing us $800 apiece. But remember, that includes pickle and mustard. Then, as their bank balances sank slowly in the West, our friends waved goodbye to the romantic Blowney Island and its happy natives. What we do with all this loot, Sam? Tear down stand, put up hotel. But little do our heroes know what kind of reception committee awaits them on the dock. Don't fail to see our next episode, Dancing on Air, or the Pottsylvania Polka. It looks like journey's end at last for our heroes. Seeking the magic mooseberry bush, a plant that produces a secret rocket fuel ingredient, our heroes have traveled to Pottsylvania, the only place in the world where mooseberries still grow. However, as they approached the dock, they saw a rather unusual reception committee. Look, Rock, they're greeting us with open arms. Yeah, but look what's in their hands. I don't like this, Bullwinkle. Our friends didn't know that the reception committee was really waiting for Boris Badenov, their arch enemy. But then neither did Boris. Ah, it's good to be back among old friends, Natasha. If those are friends, I'd hate to meet your enemies. There must be some mistake. Hello, it is I, Boris Badenov, your number one pin-up spy. I think your rating has dropped, darling. They couldn't do this to me. Get me central control. Hello, fearless leader is Boris. Boris who? Boris Badenov. Must be some mistake. We got a new spy named Badenov. You do too. It's me. We used to have Nebish named Badenov, but he was executed yesterday. What? It says so in paper. But, but, but I'm Badenov. Oh, my mistake. I pick up tomorrow's paper. <laughs> Oh, well, what's one day? Hello? Hello? I've been cut off. Uh, you're not kidding, darling. How could they do this to me? After 20 years of lying, cheating, double-crossing and backbiting, they don't like me anymore. <laughs> Come on, you! We know you're in there! Gee, Rocky, I suppose they mean us? Well, I don't know who else they mean. See, why don't we check with our next-door neighbor, Sir Thomas Lippenboris, millionaire yachtsman? He swell! And our two friends headed right for the spy's cabin. If I could just get to central control, I could explain everything. But how are you going to get past the mob on the dock? Oh, yeah. Who's afraid of a little mob? <coughs> I am. They come for me. Who's there? Oh, it's just us, Lady Alice. Good. We were just wondering if you could give us some tips on how to get along with the natives. Yeah, they seem pretty restless. 
But of course I've been. There's a mob of people out there, Sir Thomas. Yeah, and they're after us. They, uh, they after you? Oh, yes, of course, old chap. They jolly well don't like foreigners, you know. Yankee go home, all that sort of thing. But darling... Shut up, you mouth, Lady Alice. Now, you chaps got only one chance to get into country. How's that, Sir Thomas? Oh, well, it's a disguise. Disguise? Certainly. Step this way. And behind the screen, Boris quickly disguised our heroes. Oddly enough, when he was finished, they looked remarkably like an undisguised Boris and Natasha. There. A bit of all right. What, what? This mustache tickles. Oh, don't worry. It won't tickle long. And Boris led our heroes to the gangplank. Well, cheerio and pip pip all chapis, and good luck. You'll need it. Goodbye, Sir Thomas. Gee, he's a good old millionaire yachtsman. Look, Fedor, he's them. Listen, but enough of his short check, mustache check, dark glasses check, travels with beautiful lady spy check. Who oh boy, she's knock out. Dig those crazy earrings. Okay, grab them. Uh oh, Rocky. Something must have gone wrong. Cheer up, Boonwinkle. Maybe they're taking us to meet the mayor. I don't think that's the key to the city he's holding. Don't miss our next exciting episode, Ax Me Another, or Heads You Lose. Well, the good citizens of Pottsylvania are extending Rocky and Bullwinkle a real Pottsylvanian welcome. For Boris and Natasha disguised our heroes as, guess who, Boris and Natasha. Then under orders from Central Control, the boys have been arrested and hustled toward a sinister platform. Hop. But you don't understand. We're friendly. We're not. Hop. Come on, Bullwinkle. Where are we going? You heard the man. Up. Meanwhile, the real Boris and Natasha had escaped from the ship and made their way through the city to the underground headquarters of Central Control. Hmm, they fixed up the place since I was here last. You, fearless leader, where are you? Right behind you, Benito. Oh, oh, oh. Eleven, twelve, thirteen steps. Rocky, that's liable to bring bad luck if we're not careful. Now hear this. You, Boris and Natasha, are hereby condemned. Boris? Natasha? Oh, forevermore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. What is? You've mistaken us for somebody else. Sure, we're in disguise. Disguise? Yup. See, this is just the wig I got that comes. That comes right. <clears throat> Uh oh, the wig is stuck, Rock. My mustache, too. Sure enough, Boris had fastened their disguises on with permanent glue. Proceed with the proceedings. Meanwhile, at Central Control. Well, speak up, Bedinov. Don't let the boys make you nervous. <laughs> Who's nervous? You're making terrible mistakes. Nonsense. We made only one mistake here in 20 years. What was that? We hired you. What did I do? Nothing. That is the trouble. Did you bring back rocket formula? No, but... Moose berry bush? No, but... Moose berries? No, but... Moose? No, but... Go ahead, boys. Wait, did he? I mean, yes. Yes, what? Yes, sir? I mean, what did you bring back? Moose. I brought back moose. Where is he? Still on dock. Turn on viewer, Anastas. See? There he is now. You fool. He is about to be executed. No, wait just a minute, fellas. Let's not lose our heads. Don't worry, sweetheart. Only one of you loses that. Your little friend Boris, we push off cliff. Oh, that's better. We are always polite. Ladies first. But at that instant, Rocky launched himself off the cliff and down into space. Catch him. He's ruining the execution. No, I can fly. Oop. Oh, the boy, Rocky. Here he comes again, Doc. Tell me, Fedor, it says anything about Bedinov can fly? Not a word. Could be we made a mistake? Could be, but let's don't hang around to find out. Well, looks like execution is off. We got Moose. Now we put him to work for us, old buddy. You mean I'm not out of job? Of course not, dear boy. Was all mistake. You mean I get same old salary? Of course. Fifty grickles a month and all you can steal. Oh, boy. Plus fringe benefits. Fringe benefit? Yes, we don't shoot you. Back on the dock, a suspicious crowd watched as Bullwinkle and Rocky tried to get their disguises on. How you doing, Rocky? Gee, I thought it'd be years yet before I started shaving. Well, I guess you really are tourists. How do you welcome to Pottsylvania and come along? Thanks, and where are we going? Where else? To jail. Jail? 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 This is a Pottsylvanian howdy? Don't miss our next episode. The Pen Pals are Rock Hockey Rocky. 
Well, the travel folders all said welcome to Pottsylvania, but our heroes have had nothing but a bad time since they arrived. First an angry mob, then a dreadful disguise, then a near execution, and now they're on their way to jail. But we haven't done anything. Yeah, we're as innocent as the new mown snow. We're just tourists. <laughs> That's what they all say. Sure enough, our heroes' fellow prisoners were almost all American tourists just like themselves. Boy, this is sure no way to treat your friends. Don't be silly. Pottsylvania got no friends, just enemies. Well, here is your apartment. If you want anything, you can just push that button. But it's not connected. I didn't say anyone would answer. Bye. But even while our friends were languishing in the Huskow, Boris Badenov was hatching another evil plot. Now, I'm just speedballing, you understand. But as soon as Moose gives us secret formula, we... Wait! Nobody but idiot would give us secret formula. <laughs> exactly. So after he gives us formula... And Boris outlined his fiendish plan for firing a rocket ship to the moon, conquering the moon men and beaming Pottsylvanian television programs to the United States. Padanov, what good will this do us? You ever seen Pottsylvania TV? Please, not so soon after eating. Some night people in America will tune in set to midnight movie, and what do they get? Three hours Pottsylvania commercials. You think they'll know the difference? Sooner or later, yes. Then they must pay us millions to stop broadcasting. And if they don't? Oh, then we jam other programs. Instead of Lone Ranger, is coming on 30 minutes hair oil commercials. Listen. Itchy dandruff, falling hair, a dried up scalp and a dome that's bare. Gritty, grimy, greasy goo, that's what's in our new shampoo. Gunk. Get some gunk today. Enough already, please, bad enough, it's too much. You see, fearless leader, in no time at all we drive America to her knees. Carry on, bad enough, I salute you. You said it. So in the meanwhile, back in the Pottsylvania pokey... Come on, you two, out. You mean we're being released? Yes, your lawyer is here. Lawyer? We don't have no lawyer. Allow me to introduce myself, you all. Gentlemen, I'm Clarence Derenoff, attorney at law at your service. Yeah, but we didn't hire you. Tot, 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 a mere formality. Well, I paid bribe and uh, bail, so let's go. Now, wait a minute. What about all our friends here? We're not going till they go. That's right. We'll just sit here. How much extra for the others? Say, roughly 500 grickles? No. Smoothing it out a little, 250. Good. Here it is. You think I would soil my hands with a bribe? Please, just drop it in head. And a little later, Rocky and Bullwinkle saw all the tourists off on the SS Andalusia. Goodbye. Have a nice trip. Bye, Captain Peach Fuzz. Farewell, Rocky. All right, cast off forward full speed and turn off the lee and loo and loo. Also, Roger. Well, there she goes, Bullwinkle. We're all alone in a foreign land. Well, those are certainly not friendly glances. Just who do all those sinister eyeballs belong to? Don't miss our next episode, The Fright Seeing Trip, or Visit to a Small Panic. Well, our heroes are heroes again. They've rescued a boatload of tourists from the Pottsylvanian pokey and sent them on their way home. Unfortunately, it's not all clear sailing for them. You know, I got kind of a sneaky feeling we're being watched. Oh, nonsense, Bullwinkle. Who'd want to watch us? Well, the answer to that was simple enough. Everybody. For Pottsylvania was a country composed entirely of spies. Even as schoolchildren, Pottsylvanians were taught only the ABCs. Assassination, bomb throwing, and conspiracy. With an occasional course in advanced sneaking and prowling. Congratulations, Feodor. You graduated magna cum laus. And every conversation had at least two meanings. Hello, Vanya. Translation, we're going to blow up City Hall tonight. Hello, Gottwald. How's the boy? Translation, sounds like fun. Who'll be inside? Just fine, thanks. Translation, who cares? Well, see you later, Gottwald. Translation, the party starts at 7. Bring your own bomb. Bye-bye, Vanya. Translation, bye-bye, Vanya. No, Pottsylvania was hardly what you'd call a tourist paradise. Look there! Yankee, go home. Boy, they sure don't like baseball players, do they? Well, here's a hotel, Bullwinkle. Let's go in. Hold it, buddy. You got password? Password? It's the hotel, isn't it? Still need password. But we don't know it. Let's go. Hold it, buddy. You like to buy password? Buy it? 
Special today, 10 words for dollar. We don't need 10 words. Okay, 10 cents each. It's a deal. Come on, Berlin. Hold it, buddy. You got password? Sure, it's, um, moleskin. This is first class hotel. We don't take cheap 10 cent passwords. Well, I got a password right here. Knuckles. <laughs> That's the password, all right. Go on in. Inside the lobby, our heroes were once again the target of all eyes. Hi, can we get a room? Certainly, Mr. Smith. Smith? My name isn't Smith. I'm really... No, 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 no. no names, please. Just sign here. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle. Everybody's named Smith. That's a funny coincidence, ain't it? Well, when a Rome do as the Romans do. Well, I never heard of no Romans named Smith. But our heroes had to sign the register Plotsylvanian style. Rocky Smith and Bullwinkle Smith. When they got to their rooms, Rocky immediately started organizing the great Mooseberry expedition. First, we gotta get a guide, Bullwinkle. Somebody who knows the country. Maybe there's a guide advertising in the newspapers. Let's get one down at the corner. Hey, get you ice cream bars. Also secret papers. Secret papers from an ice cream man? Sure, we got a 28th flavor of a classified information. If you find a page in red ink, you get a free secret. Thanks a lot, but no thanks. You're welcome. Hey, get you Adam Bumsicle here. Our heroes had another shock when they opened the door of their room. Bullwinkle, look at that! Yes, the room was a shambles. Everything had been turned inside out and upside down. And what's more, all our papers are gone. Gone? Oh, well. And so was all our money. Well, that's the breaks, I guess. And so was your autographed picture of Sonny Tuft. Sonny Tufts! Well, now them rascals have gone too far. Don't miss our next episode, Boris Burgles Again, or Sinner Take All. Well, our heroes are really closing in on the mooseberry bush, for they've hired a famous mountain climber, Sir Hilary Pushimoff, and his friend, the Indian guide, Princess Bubbles, to guide them up the Grimalaya Mountains. Little do they know, however, that the guides are really those two spies, Boris and Natasha. Please, you're giving away the plot. Well, Sir Hillary, here's where we're going. High on the slopes of Won't You Take a Peak. Won't You Take a Peak? I take it you know the name. Know it. It is the most feared mountain in old Pennsylvania. Yeah, but you're not scared, are you, Sir Hillary? Of course not. Him always turn green this time of year. If I could just have a breath fresh air. Why, certainly. And Boris left the room and quickly made his way to the underground headquarters of Central Control. Something wrong, Ibedinov? You, you see where I'm supposed to go? Hmm, why don't you take a peek? Lovely vacation spot. Vacation spot? If you're an iceberg. But, but, but fearless leader. Silence, Bedinov. It's only a little 20,000 foot mountain peak. You're not chicken, are you? <laughs> come, 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 come. Remember Pottsylvania. Well... Remember who pays your salary. Well... Remember your sense of honor. Let's go back to who pays the salary. Besides, if you don't go, I got to report you to Mr. Big. <laughs> Mr. Big? You wouldn't? Yes, you would. All right, I'm going. Only a and a few hours later, Boris and Natasha were leading our friends up the slippery slopes of Wancha Take a Peak. Well, which way do we go now? That, that way. way. Well, we can't go in both directions. Yeah, we're all roped together. Great spirit say go that way. You going to argue with me? This way. You going to argue with great spirit? That way. Maybe we could split the difference and go straight ahead. I say this way. I say that way. Well, if you insist, that way. <laughs> Golly, they're sliding clear down the slope. And we're all roped together. Brace yourself, Bullwinkle. Right, Rocky. I'd just like to see them budge me now. They'd have to uproot this great big tree. And in just a few seconds, the entire party had slid to the bottom of a deep crevasse in the snow. Where's Sir Hillary? I don't know. Here's his hat. Yeah, but where's he? I'm under the hat, you idiot. Well, peek a boo. Hey, look there! Oh, boy! Snow! No, no, Bullwinkle, up higher! Well, I'll be a moose's uncle! Yep, it's a mooseberry bush! Our search is at an end! Oh, boy, and we made it in only one episode! So after carefully uprooting the precious mooseberry bush, the party started off with the two spies well in the lead. Now Patsylvania can make secret rocket fuel. If moose and squirrel do not take it to USA. How can moose and squirrel take to USA if there is no moose and squirrel? Oh, Boris, you are a sly boots. When does it happen? 
No time like the present. Observe, Natasha. Secret weapon. Weapon? But that's only a piece of candy. <laughs> Watch. Hello, Dandel! Anybody care for Jawbreaker? Mighty yummy. Sure, why not? Okay, here it comes. And Boris started the Jawbreaker rolling down the snow-covered slope. And in just a little while, it picked up a covering of loose snow, then formed a snowball that grew until it was a tremendous ball the size of a house that hurtled down on our heroes. Don't fail to see our next episode, Avalanche is Better Than None, or Snow's Your Old Man. Well, our heroes had just a brief moment of triumph in their search for a mooseberry bush. For not only did Natasha, posing as a guide, take possession of the bush, but Boris rolled a piece of candy downhill toward them that rapidly grew into a snowball as big as a house. Gee, we just asked Sir Hillary for a jawbreaker. Well, we sure got one. That thing would bust anybody's door. Head for those trees, Bullwinkle. The snowball may break against them. But as our heroes dashed for the trees, the gigantic snowball overtook them. Hang on, Rocky! Look at that, Natasha. A perfect strike. Not quite, darling. There's two left. Yes, remarkable as it seems, our friends were still intact, although just a little groggy. Quick, get his license number, Rock. Oh, you poor fellows. What a dreadful accident. And not only that, we didn't even get the jawbreaker. We have more important things to do, Bullwinkle. We gotta get that bush back to the USA. So our friends started off through the snowfields of Wancho Take a Peek. It soon became evident that their guide lacked a certain amount of confidence. Well, which way now, Sir Hillary? Well, let me consult my compass. Hmm. Heads, we go this way. You're sure now? Of course, I know every rock in these mountains. Did you know that one? Of course. Hello, Cliff. Hey, Rocky, look. Footprint. Good. We'll just follow him back to... Hey, wait a minute. What's up? Those tracks look familiar, Bullwinkle. Hey, step into that footprint. What do you know? Somebody takes the same size hoof as me. Nobody's feet are that big but yours, Bullwinkle. You mean? Yep, those are our tracks. We're going in circles, Sir Hillary. Circles? Impossible. Then how come these moose prints? Think fast, Sir Hillary. I'm sorry to say, old chappy, those not moose prints. They're not? Yet, those are prints of fierce, wild, man-eating creature that roams when you take a peek. Fierce? Wild? You mean... Yes, these are tracks of abominable snowmen. The abominable snowman? Boris, darling, you flipped. Well, I had to say something. But he's no such animal. <laughs> he's now, and if Smoose and Squirrel don't get back, who is to blame? Abominable, abominable snowman. Boris, darling, you've done it again. Of course, never underestimate the power of a schnook. But though the Wily Boris had convinced the boys that they weren't going in circles, he still had problems, for he led them onto a huge overhanging ledge of snow and ice. Well, looks like a nice place to stop and have a lunch. It doesn't look very safe to me. Relax. Enjoy the echo. Hello? Hello? Holy smoke, look at that! Sure enough, the vibration of the echo had been enough to disturb the delicate balance of the snowy overhang, and it began to crack loose. Don't move, Bullwinkle! Unfortunately, Bullwinkle had just been ready to eat a hard-boiled egg. Uh, uh, Shh! Quiet, Bullwinkle! I can't help it, Brock. There's pepper on this egg, and... Uh, uh, Hold it! There. I'm okay now. But our heroes plummeted toward the valley floor a thousand feet below. Don't miss our next episode, Below Zero Heroes, or I Only Have Ice for You. Well, as usual, things are going from bad to worse for our heroes. Last time, you remember, Boris Badenov led them out on an overhanging ledge of snow to eat lunch. And then Bullwinkle put too much pepper on his hard-boiled egg, and when he sneezed... <laughs> the entire ledge broke off. I don't see them, Boris. Me too. I guess they're buried alive. Aren't we going to do something? Of course. Here, blow taps in E-flat. So, farewell. And goodbye. Down you go, in the snow you must die With the mooseberry bush Mooseberry bush! That doesn't rhyme! Natasha, they still have the bush! You mean... Yes, we must save them! Again? And so the two spies furiously set to work to dig our heroes out of the snow pile. 
Well, Moose will be out in a minute. Here is Squirrel already, and he has Mooseberry Bush. Good. Then we don't need Moose. And Boris raised the shovel and brought it down with a crash. Gee, you're shivering, Sir Hillary. He's just my old malaria. Well, let's go. It's getting dark. The party pressed onward and suddenly came upon a set of giant footprints. They are tracks of the abominable snowman. The, the abominable, abominable snowman? Yes, a fierce man-eating monster. I still say they look like your hoof prints, Bullwinkle. Boris, I don't think we can fool them much longer. No, Squirrel is too smart for us. Yes, he's got sneaking hunch there is no such animal as the abominable snowman. There's only one way to convince him. And that is? He's got to see abominable snowman. But how? Easy. Tonight, after they are in bed, you put on white sheet over your head and... <laughs> I get it, darling. I am the snowman. If this doesn't get rid of them, my name isn't Sir Hillary Pushemov. And it isn't. And so late that night, as our heroes lay in their tent. Say, Rock, do you think there might be such a thing as a man-eating abominable snowman? Of course not. How about a moose-eating abominable snowman? Oh, no, Bullwinkle. I still think those were your footprints. But just think if they weren't. Look at the size of that thing. Anybody with a foot that big must really be a monster. Go to sleep, Bullwinkle. There's no such thing as a... Ooh. What's that? It's just the wind, Bullwinkle. Oh, I could have sworn it was a... Ooh. There it goes again. It's just the wind, Bullwinkle. With galoshes on? Sure enough, just outside their tent stood a pair of huge overshoes and towering above them an enormous white figure with glowing eyes and teeth made of coal. Looks just like a snowman. A, a snowman. snowman! And the boys leaped out of their tent and sped off into the night. <laughs> Look at them go. Natasha, my dear, you did marvelous job. What do you talk, darling? I haven't started yet. Natasha. This is you? Who else? Then this is who? One guess, darling. The uh, abominable uh, 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 snowman. And the two spies followed our heroes into the night as the huge creature turned its baleful eyes on them and lumbered forward. Be sure to see our next episode, The Snowman Cometh, or An Icicle Built for Two. Well, Rocky and Bullwinkle's dream of getting a mooseberry bush has turned into a nightmare, for they have at last run into that legendary figure of mountain lore, the abominable snowman. Is he following us, Bullwinkle? I'm not even going to turn around to find out. Even Boris Badenov, who thought he had made up the snowman out of sheer make-believe, had to admit that there was such a thing. But Boris, a live man-eating snowman, such a thing couldn't be. You give me couldn't be, he give me is. And as the poor fleeing figures scrambled over the ice, the snowman steadily gained on them. Wait, wait, hold Hold up! What is it, Sir Hillary? There's only one way for any of us to escape. What's that? Somebody's got to stay here and fight it out with snowmen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How's about you staying? That don't make no sense at all. Whatever we do, we better do fast. He'll be here in a minute. Well, there's only one fair way to decide who stays. We draw straws. Boy, it's not that. Long straw gets to be big hero, okay? Well, I suppose that's fair enough. But where are we going to get straws? <laughs> Just so happens I got some right here. Yeah, funny how that works out. Everybody take one. Princess Bobblis, Squirrel, me, and now Moose. Boy, it sure is a long one. Yeah. That's the first straw I ever seen I could pole vault with. You won! Congratulations, old fellow! Yeah, I'm just lucky, I guess. Now, if you'll excuse us. Well, I suppose it's up to me, Rocky. I... Rocky? Yoo-hoo! Rocky! Gee, he's gone. Yes, Bullwinkle stood alone as the snowman came nearer and nearer. I feel just like what's-his-name at the bridge. When the snowman was within range, Bullwinkle jabbed at him with his makeshift weapon. Unfortunately, the telescoping straw did just that. What do you know? I got a short straw after all. Okay, cold and ugly, pull him up. Just then, the moose heard a welcome voice from above him. Bullwinkle, stand aside! Yes, high on a nearby cliff was Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Of course, our hero would never desert a friend in need. Out of the way, Bullwinkle! Here I come! And from his high perch, Rocky launched himself like a guided missile directly at the huge form of the abominable snowman. And then... 
The impact was tremendous. So severe was the shock that in Japan, seismograph needles jumped right off the paper. In Honolulu, there was a snowstorm. And in Waxahachie, Texas, for the first time in 17 years, it's rain. Back in Pottsylvania, Rocky pulled himself out of the snowbank and dashed to his pal. Poor Rico, speak to me, speak to me. Uh, certainly, what would you like to hear? Oh, thank goodness you're okay. Oh, I'm fine, but uh, he's having a little trouble. Sure enough, the abominable snowman was behaving very oddly. Oh, oh, oh. What do you suppose he's saying? I don't know, but he's saying in two voices. What you say to us, snowman? I said, get me out of here. Bullwinkle, I recognize that voice. You're sure it's not just his stomach growling? Get me out of here. Bullwinkle, that voice belongs to Gidney, the moon man. Great gobs of goo, Rocky. The moon man has been et by the snowman. Well, could Bullwinkle be right for the first time? And if so, what in the world can be done to go get Gidney? Be sure to see our next episode, The Moon Man is Blue, or The Inside Story. Well, the attack of the abominable snowman came to grief when our boy Rocky zoomed to the defense of his pal, Bullwinkle. The snowman definitely came off the loser, but then both our heroes were surprised to hear a familiar voice emerging from inside the snowman. Get me out of here. That's our friend Gidney, the moon man. But how can we get him out? He's been et by the snowman. No, Bullwinkle, he is the snowman. Only half, Rocky. I'm the other part. Hey, that sounds like, like... The name is Cloyd. Gee, you sure sounds like him, too. Here, Bullwinkle, help me tear this cover off. And when Rocky zipped open the cover, sure enough, there were the two moon men, Gidney and Cloyd. Whatever were you doing in that getup? Tell him, Cloyd. Well, I... I thought it would be a good joke. Joke? It like to scared us out of seven years' growth. Yeah, our two guides still haven't come back. Sure enough, Boris and Natasha were at that moment heading over the hill and into the sunset. We left Mooseberry Bush. Don't talk to me about trifles. But what we do when Central Control ask questions? What else? We look him straight in the eye and lie. But how come you're clear over here in Pennsylvania, Gidney? Yeah, last we heard you were knocking him dead at Las Vegas. That was the trouble. And as they trudged down the hill, Gidney told the boys his story. It seems that after their great success as a song and dance team, a television producer signed them to appear on a new western show called Moonsmoke. Everything went well until the last scene in the show. Gee whiz, Marshal Moon. Here comes the Crater Kid now. Something you wanted, Crater? Yep. I'm calling your bluff, Marshal. Draw! Cloyd drew, all right, but unfortunately fired his scrooch gun directly at the camera. As a result, the entire television audience was frozen solid. All over the country, people were literally glued in front of the television sets. The late, 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 late show had its biggest audience ever. Gee, then what happened? Our show was canceled. How come? With an audience that couldn't move away from their sets, they didn't need shows. You mean? Yep. Now they're showing nothing but commercials. I'm not so sure I want to go home, Rock. Oh, it's probably fixed by now, Bullwinkle. Besides, we got to take back this mooseberry bush. Mooseberry bush? You found the last one in the world. We can make our rocket fuel. We can get back to the moon. Oh, you're just our favorite Earth people. Well, I... Uh, well, I really plan to give this bush to our government. Give it to your government. But that means we'll never get back to the moon. No, we'll never see the old home crater again. No more sitting in the porch in the evening, watching the Earth come up. Gee, fellas, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Rocky. We, you have your duty to do. Golly, Bullwinkle, I just feel terrible about Gidney and Cloyd. Yeah, suppose we were on the moon and couldn't get back. Yeah. Bullwinkle, I'm going to do it. Good. What? I'm going to get the moon men back to the moon. And let down the entire whole United States government? Rocket J. Squirrel, I am ashamed on you. And the indignant Bullwinkle turned on his heel and walked away. Well, will Rocky, our Rocky, really fail to carry out his mission? Don't miss our next episode, Fuels Rush In or the Star Spangled Boner. 
Well, it looks as if our heroes have finally melted the myth of the abominable snowman. The awesome creature turned out to be the two moon men, Gidney and Cloyd, in disguise. I thought it would be a funny joke. Funny? It was a panic. But when the moon men learned that Rocky and Bullwinkle were going to return the mooseberry bush to the USA, their faces fell. That means we can't make the rocket fuel from it. And we'll never get to go home again. It was then that Rocky made his decision. Bullwinkle, I want to send Gidney and Cloyd back to the moon. And let down the entire U.S. of A? No, wait. I got a plan. But first we have to get back home. Well, that was easier said than done. For at that moment, their nemesis, Boris Badenov, was receiving his latest set of instructions right across the head. So you have failed again, Badenov. But fearless leader, the snowman... You left your post. A hundred feet high. Deserted in face of enemy. Three sets of teeth. Didn't get moose berries. All shot. Didn't get rid of moose and squirrel. Like razor blade. Hit me with that last one again. Didn't get rid of moose and squirrel. But we did. Boris. Shut up, Neteshe. You got rid of moose and squirrel? Would I forget such a thing? <laughs> I might be coward, turncoat, double crosser, but I'm not sloppy. They are kaput? Of course. But Boris. Natasha, we left them with snowmen. What do you think happened to them? <laughs> That's right. If moose and squirrel were still alive, your life wouldn't be worth a plugged kopeck. Of course. Good job, Berinov. Have cigar. Thank you, fearless leader. <laughs> you can call me FL. And the triumphant Boris and Natasha made their way to the exit of the underground headquarters of Central Control. Push up manhole cover, darling. I can't. Somebody's standing on it. Hey, you got the hiccups, Bullwinkle? No, must be an earthquake. Boris, you hear that? Is the moose that indestructible meat with something wrong, Bedinov? <laughs> no, not at all, they fell. Then open manhole. Is somebody standing on it? <laughs> Let's wait till later, eh? How about next summer? Out of way, Bedinov. I open it. And open it he did, for at that time, Bowwinkle was no longer standing on the cover. This is your idea of joke, Bedinov? Of course not, they fell. Fearless leader to you, Badenov. Yes, fearless leader. And give me my cigar. And the head of the spy ring made his exit, leaving a badly shaken Boris. What's going to happen if he sees moose and squirrel alive? Well, you're in hot water again, darling. I'm always in hot water. I'm beginning to feel like teabag. Oh, Natasha, why I couldn't be a successful villain? Cheer up, Boris. To me, you will always be a dirty, double-crossing skunk. Oh, Natasha, you always know the right thing to say. Meanwhile, our heroes were having their own troubles. We want four tickets on the first boat leaving Pennsylvania. <laughs> All right, what's so doggone hilarious? You crazy fools! Everybody wants to leave Pennsylvania. Sure enough, every dock, airport, and train station was simply jammed with people trying to get out of Pennsylvania. And they were all ahead of Rocky and Bowwinkle. Doggone it! First they say, Yankee, go home. Then they won't let us leave. Well, it looks as if our heroes are in Pennsylvania to stay. Be sure to see our next episode, The Pennsylvania Permanent, or I've grown accustomed to the place. Last time you remember, our heroes and the moon men discovered that they couldn't leave Pottsylvania because everybody else in the country wanted to get out too. As a result, our boys found themselves at the end of a waiting line a mile long. But why do all these people want to leave? Why are you going? Well, let's be nice and say we just despise the place. So do they. Well, when's the next train leave? Hard to tell. Why? Somebody stole the tracks. Gee, this looks bad, Rocky. You mean we're stuck here in Pottsylvania? Gee, how are we ever going to get out? Look there! That's how! Tick-tock taxi company, two drivers, no waiting. Oh, boy, a taxi cab! Quick, climb in! I wonder why they call this the Tick-tock taxi company. Rocky wouldn't have asked if he'd been able to see under the back seat, for the entire rear of the taxi was one big time bomb. Oh, who could have played such a fiendish trick on our friend? <laughs> <laughs> who guesses? Well, it looks as if Boris and Natasha are really in the driver's seat at last. But not for long. How come we're stopping, Rocky? I don't know. Hey, what's the trouble? We got split king bolt in manifold housing. That's bad? Bad. If we don't get a new one, we'll strip the sleeve bushing right down to the gasket seal. Yo, that happened to an uncle of mine once. Well, how long will it take to get a new one? All depends, but don't worry. You won't have to wait long. 
Come on, Spike. And the two spies sped off down the road, leaving our friends gathered around that highly explosive taxi. Hey, what's that ticking sound? Must be the taxi meter. What taxi meter? Oh, come now, Gidney. Every taxi has a meter. Not this one. Of course it does. And we gotta turn it off. Yeah, or this ride will cost us a fortune. Must be here somewhere. It's not in front, Bullwinkle. Not in here, either. When it goes off, Boris. Any second now. It's not underneath, Rocky. Not in the trunk, neither. But I can still hear a ticking. Well, I give up. Bullwinkle, look out! Too late. Bullwinkle's weight had started the taxi running back down the road, and as our friends watched, it careened out of sight behind a hill. An instant later, there was a tremendous explosion followed by a cloud of black smoke, followed by Boris and Natasha. Bullwinkle, the taxi cab exploded! You know what that means? Yeah, it means we'll never know how much we owe. No, it means somebody's out to get us. But why? We haven't done anything. Maybe that's the trouble. Well, anyway, we're stuck here in Pennsylvania again. Not necessarily, Rocky. Look there. Sure enough, a little farther ahead, a sentry stood guard beside a barrier that stretched across the road. Oh, boy, a railroad station. No, Bullwinkle, that's the border. I was wondering where the tracks were. But who's that feller with the gun? That's a sentry. Boy, he sure needs a haircut. That's his hat. Well, he certainly has a tall head. You moo men got your papers ready? We don't need any, Rocky. Everybody needs papers to cross Pennsylvania border. Lots and lots of papers. Not us. Why not you? Because we're not in Pennsylvania. You're not? No, we're across the border. Hey, you couldn't do that. But we just did. Well, maybe you did, but your friends stay here permanent. And the angry sentry raised his rifle and pointed it directly at our heroes. Don't miss our next episode, The Boundary Bounders, or Some Like It Shot. While well, Rocky and Bowwinkle reached the Pottsylvanian border with the Mooseberry Bush still intact, but now it seemed that they were going to be stopped just inches short of their goal, for when their friends, the Moon Men, slipped across the border without proper papers, the Pottsylvanian sentry became so enraged that he raised his weapon and pointed it at our heroes. Hey, now, that thing might be loaded. Might be. is loaded. Stand back, Rocky. I'll protect you. Oh, they got me. Goodbye, Rocky. Where are you going? I'm going west. Where do you think? Yeah, but you weren't hurt. I'm not? No, look! Sure enough, on the other side of the border stood Cloyd, the moon man, with his trusty Scrooge gun. Well, somebody got hit. Sure, look! It's the sentry. He's been uh, Scrooged. Froze solid. Yep. Come on, Rocky. What about Vladimir here? Oh, he'll be all right as soon as he gets unscrewed. Well, how long will that be? About 90 minutes. Cloyd, that says years. Oh, so it does. Well, <laughs> that's certainly one on me. Yeah, but what do we do with Vladimir? Just stand him up. Who's going to notice whether a sentry is scrooched or not? Sure enough, Vladimir remained motionless at his post from that moment on, and he was very happy. Tourists came to have their pictures taken with him. He was written up in Crime, a Pottsylvanian weekly news magazine, and he served as a model for every sentry in the Pottsylvanian army. Eventually, he was promoted to general, retired, and spent his declining years in his old hometown where he became known as the pigeon's best friend. Yes, there was no doubt Vladimir was for the birds. But back to our story. About time, too. Well, anyway, we're out of Pottsylvania with a mooseberry bush. Yeah, let's get it back to the government right away. Hey, look down there. A ship! And it's headed our way. Well, how are we going to get to it? You forget, Rocky, we can just fade out here and fade in again down on the ship. Like this. Darn, missed it. Fortunately, Cloyd's aim was better than Gidney's, and he was able to persuade the captain of the small freighter to pick up our heroes. A short while later, the good ship was steaming across the sea toward America. Well, Bullwinkle, we're going home at last. I wish we were. But you are, Gidney. Back to the moon? You're giving us the bush? You can't do that, Rock. This is government property. Don't worry, Bullwinkle. I'm not going to give them the bush. Then how the ding-dong you going to get them home? Moon-wise, that is. Look, Bullwinkle, why does the government want a secret rocket fuel? So as we can send a American to the moon. Right. So my plan is obvious. Well, certainly it's obvious, but what is it? Simple. We'll make Americans out of Guinea and Cloy. And, and send, send them, them to, to the, the moon. moon. Well, great. But how do we make Americans out of them? Pay them red, white, and blue? No, nope. 
I think I got a better way. Rocky wouldn't have been so optimistic if he had known what was going on at that moment in a press meeting on Capitol Hill. Just uh, what does your new bill mean, Senator? Well, you see, right now, it's entirely too easy to become an American. This bill's going to make it tougher. Now, what do you mean it's easy, Senator? Well, all you got to do is be born here. This large loophole has got to be plugged up. Well, how will this new proposal affect Rocky's plans for the Moon Men? Don't miss our next episode, The Washington World, or Rocky Off the Record. Well, Rocky's plans for Gidney and Cloyd to become the first Americans on the moon have hit a snag in the person of Senator Fussmussen of the Citizenship Committee. Too many people are claiming to be Americans. Alaskans, Hawaiians, Californians. It's disgraceful. Senator X to stop moon, men! We'll never get home again. Nonsense! We're going to teach you to be Americans. Yeah, time we get finished, you'll look as American as I do. I'd really rather not. Bring in our whole library of books, Bull. Here they are, Rock. The Farmer's Almanac, the Bobsy Twins at Camp Wahoo, and my personal bound volume of ghastly comics. The boys set to work to convert the moon men, Gidney and Cloyd, into typical Americans. Unfortunately, their idea of what an American should know was rather limited. Okay, Gidney. How many days in September? 30 days has September. Right. Say, you're getting as smart as me. How do you make fire without matches? Rub two Boy Scouts together. No, oh, no, no, no. Oh, uh, sticks. Rub two sticks. That's it. Well, Bullwinkle, I guess they're ready to become Americans. Yep. Sort of gets you right in here, don't it? Yeah, I'm just quietly proud. But the next day in Senator Fussmussen's committee room, the moon men didn't make out so well. If the president doesn't sign a bill, how many days before it becomes a law? Uh... 30 days of September, April, June, and November. Apart from congressional action, how may a bill be introduced? By rubbing two sticks together. What? How are they doing, Bullwinkle? Oh, they're getting the answers perfect, Rock. Good. Only thing is, he keeps asking the wrong questions. Sure enough, the two moon men were quickly ejected from the committee room, but they didn't seem at all unhappy. Well, <laughs> we made it. We'll never be able to thank you enough, Rocky. What do you mean? You flunked your exam, didn't you? Oh, more than that. Senator Fussmussen says we shouldn't even be allowed in the country. Oh? So guess what? He's deporting us. Sending us back where we came from. You mean the M-U-N-E moon? That's right. And of course, there's only one way we can get there. The Mooseberry Bush. You're gonna go by Bush? Sounds a little scratchy. No, Bullwinkle. We'll use the Mooseberry Bush to make your secret rocket fuel. Oh, of course. It's been so long, I almost forgot the plot. Well, let's go. And within a few days, Bullwinkle had whipped up an exact duplicate of his Grandma Moose's fudge cake batter. Just slip it in this blast chamber, Bullwinkle. Right. Of course, all official Washington turned out for the Moon Men's departure. Senator Fussmussen himself bade them goodbye. Goodbye. Now close the hatch and blast off. Right. But when Bullwinkle slammed the hatch closed, he caught the tail of Senator Fussmussen's coat. Ten, nine, eight. What's this? My, my coat is caught. Six, five... Four. Well, take your coat off! That wouldn't be dignified! I got it! Three, two... Quickly, Rocky zoomed to the president's chair and whispered in his ear. One, zero, fire! Somebody do something! Very well. Senator Fossmussen, I appoint you the new ambassador to the moon! And as the crowd cheered, the spaceship bearing Gidney Cloyd and our first interplanetary diplomat zoomed upward and out of sight. Well, Bullwinkle, you did it again. Yeah, once the hero, always the hero, I guess. You said it, Bullwinkle. Didn't I, though? And the boys trudged away from the airport and into a brand new adventure. Don't miss the beginning of it in the next chapter of Rocky the Flying Squirrel.